heard it all. I'm telling you, you can pass this. speaker, author, and coach to thousands of professionals and organizations worldwide, including NASA, the U.S. Air Force, USACE, U.S. Army, the Department of Transportation, the FBI. Your friend, Phil. Over to you, Phil. Hey, my fellow project managers, I hope you're doing awesome. You've heard it, you've heard it all. I'm telling you, you can pass this exam. But I wanted to add further value to you by just giving you a few ideas about how exam questions can trip you up. And if you have been trying to get certified over and over again without success, I want you to begin to look at questions in a different light. Okay, so this is to give you a more pragmatic way of addressing the problem. Yes, I've given you that page the stamp out page yes i've given you tips about pages in the pembok guide but i want to focus a little bit on how questions can trip you up so a few days ago i was playing with a few questions kind of kicking them around back and forth between our students and i realized that they were getting tripped up by a certain question characteristic. They're getting tripped up on questions that have multiple dimensions. So I want to address this multiple dimension question writing approach that people might be struggling with. Maybe you've come across such a thing as well. This might help you, okay? so. The questions are usually you are a project manager doing X, Y, Z. Let me just go to the whiteboard, chart this out a little bit, and you'll get the idea of what I'm trying to say. All right. So it usually starts off like this. You are a project manager. and they usually tell you what you're doing you are doing that whatever it is okay we'll just say you're doing just put x variable okay now where I see people beginning to get distracted is when the question shifts into the reasoning behind what you're doing and I'll explain this in a, in a few seconds so think about it your project manager you're doing X and then the question could follow up in order to achieve Y. Your project manager, you're doing X, whatever that variable is, in order to achieve Y, where you will derive A variable Z and then a red heron a red heron is added to the mix what do I mean a distractor so sum it to the effect of while you are doing X you realize a problem 
which could affect outcome Z. Are you following the line of thought? Okay, so this is a question with various aspects and variables. If you don't keep your eye on this first one, I'm going to make these different colors. Let's make this blue. Let's make this a darker red or brownish. And this, I'll make this green. All right. If you don't keep your eye on the blue, you will get the question wrong. Whatever the question ends up being, if you don't keep your eye on the blue, what you are doing, you end up getting the question wrong. The question usually ends with a big finish such as, It's usually something to the effect of what should you do next? Are you looking at these variables? Are you seeing how these variables are being set up? You're a project manager, you're doing X. That's, that's the first piece of the question. All right. Now they're beginning to derail you, or let's say beginning to test your focus and your understanding, as one of my students, former student, now PMP boss, would say, Dre, he would say, they want to find out if you're loyal. <laughs> they, want, they want to find out, are you still loyal to the PMBOK guide? In other words, are you really paying attention to what you are doing as a project manager? And are you really aware of what you should be focusing on as a project manager? You see? So by the time you get to point two, you're beginning to get a little bit of a pull, a gravitational pull away from one. This is why questions sometimes appear very ambiguous because they put in a number of variables but it's done in a subtle manner so your project manager doing X in order to achieve Y where you will derive Z so you're doing X because you want to achieve Y and from Y you're gonna derive Z whatever that is while you're doing X you realize a problem which could affect outcome Z what should you do next let me show you what this question has done. This question has taken your focus away from number one. What are you doing? What should you do next? Two and three, let's put in three. Three, distractor. It said a problem which could affect outcome Z, but still that's not really focusing on I'm doing item one, what should I do next? Item two, what I'm trying to achieve, and all these other things, they could be red herrings on the question. Okay? I'm not saying every single question is like this, but I'm trying to show you how your focus could easily be taken away. Your focus could be taken away from what exactly you should be focusing on. And this is why certain folks may have trouble on the test because your attention is being taken away from the real thing you should be looking at. And I mean, someone could come away thinking, oh, but I answered the question based on three. I realized the problem. And what should I do next? Solve the problem. No. What should you do next could be a number of could do next or should do next. You know, 
the question could be fine-tuned to say which process should you do next or it could just be a what should you do next but you don't want to lose sight of the first point I realized that questions like this were throwing my students all over the place and they were getting distracted you know I think I had on one question I had zero correct answers on some questions I had like a 60 percent correct answer you know and this is what the PMI does which is why when the questions are served just know they've been passed around the block they've been tested so by the time the question is coming to you, almost guaranteed, a certain number of people will always get that question wrong because they are focusing on the wrong thing. They're not answering the question, focusing on the first point. They got lost along the way. And this is just one, one scenario. There are many different scenarios I could paint, you know. But the overarching thing is, as you see these questions, do not forget what you are really doing in the very first stage. If you do, you're going to be derailed and you're going to get the question wrong. And, and this is one of the reasons why certain questions are not home runs for people. Okay, so talking about passing the exam, you really need to strategically and intentionally look at the, the moving parts. You, you know, you see a question written as one block, then it shifts to another. You need to feel that shift. You need to know, oh, wait a minute, that question, it shifted. It, they've moved from what I'm doing to something else. What are they really looking for in the final you know, the big hurrah at the end. What are they really looking for? When they give you that final line, you can either make or break your experience by following this tip. Don't get lost. Hold on to that first thing. And as you're navigating the question, always remember, you're doing this. You're doing X. You're doing Y. You're doing Z. Still along some rather elementary lines, but nonetheless, something that could help you. You could get questions such as, you are creating or developing a document A document X. This document will be used to Y. The document can also be used for whatever. You could get a what should you do next based on knowing which document you're working on or you could get which tool and technique will you use to create X. Something like that. There are many, many ways, you know, if I was a question writer, I could cause a whole lot of havoc just by messing around with these four blocks one block of what is going on a second block of what could result from what is going on 
and I could even be more malicious as a question writer and I could totally throw you off. I could give you th streams of thought, streams of possibilities that could derail you by giving you candy, PM candy, things that excite you but are just totally irrelevant. Totally irrelevant. Let me give you another example. Another example. Okay. Let's look at a scenario whereby you get a question. Here is a network diagram. Okay. There are 12 nodes. One of the nodes, or I should say one of the branches, is hanging. What do I mean by that? Well, if you haven't seen one of those network diagrams with a hanging branch that isn't really joining to the others, it's going off on its own. So there are 12 nodes, one of the branches is hanging. Here are all the activity durations. The customer would like the deliverable on the day you end. Okay? And then it could build on that to say, what is the project slack? If I gave you a big old network diagram, with all these fancy arrows and images, that's enough to excite anyone that has studied that. So imagine if I gave you a big old network diagram to go with this. A lot of folks would rub their hands in glee, like I used to in those days. Oh, I've read this, I know this. And start just go out of the gate and begin to solve that network diagram like a bat being let out of I don't know where. However, if you read the question carefully, you realize that there's no need for you to solve a single thing. If the customer would like the deliverable on the day you end, then you've got no slack. You've got zero slack. There is absolutely no need for you to start solving anything here. This is an example of where you would do so much work, 10 minutes worth of work, only to realize that there was no point. Another example of such could be, here's a network diagram. There are 12 nodes. One of the branches is hanging. Here are the durations. And then, what is the free slack of task A? Task A is the first task. Now, if you get a question like this, again, you could get excited and begin solving till the cows come home, but Task A, if it's a, a network diagram where there is, you know, one beginning task, task A, the free slack will be zero. You don't need to solve nothing. It's going to be zero. The same as a task at the end of the chain. It will be zero. So getting all excited and solving this network diagram is only going to waste your time you, you will get the answer right, but you would have wasted 10 minutes on a network diagram that is asking you 
what is the free slack of an activity that's on the critical path? Or what is the total slack of an activity on the critical path? Do you see what I'm saying? I'm trying to get you to see these questions for what they are. A lot of these questions, a lot of these questions, they don't need as much effort as people put in. People put in a lot of effort, but unfortunately, they didn't need to. They didn't need to do what they're doing. Okay? So I hope this is helping you. I hope this is, you know, kind of turning on the light bulbs bit by bit for you to see that the reasons why certain folks may not do well in a question is not because they haven't studied. It's not because they didn't read. But more than anything else, it's because they are not paying attention to what the question is asking. They might just be in the dark. They may be oblivious, you see. So these are just a few examples of how questions are engineered and how people could totally miss the boat when it comes to answering these questions. So let's uh, have a little recap. First of all, I gave you the breakdown of X. You're doing X in order to achieve Y. That just showed you red herrings could be deliberately placed in questions. It's testing your loyalty, like Dre said. You know. Secondly, you could be given a, oh, you're creating this document or you're creating this plan. You know, which tool and technique would you use to create this plan or that thing? And you'll be given a tool and technique that maps back to the process where that thing is created or where that thing is done. And then I'm giving you some more problem-oriented, formula-oriented type question. It looks formula-oriented on the surface or technical on the surface, but it's really logic, you know. So you got to get your logic game up. When it comes to network diagrams, you got to know the definitions inside out to know when logic is needed to solve the problem versus a calculator, a calculator. So don't make the mistake of wasting time on questions where the answer is staring at you in the face. On the critical path, you got zero, zero slack, zero float in all of the activities, free float, total float. If the end date of the project is the same as customer required due date as in the previous one, zero project float. So you got to know the theory behind whatever you're doing, okay? Don't just read blindly, but know the theory, okay? And practice questions that are tested and tried, you know. I tell people, don't just jump on these ridiculously cheap, free mock exams on the internet. No, I didn't say companies. I'm talking about people that just go to the internet and do a search. What is wrong with you? Are you kidding me? You're, you're playing with your $555 by searching for these crummy questions on the internet. And you're jubilating that you found a treasure trove of rubbish on the internet. Seriously? Don't do it. If you haven't heard it before, there's a lot of poison out there. I'm amazed, watch this, a student jubilated about finding four mock exams on the web. I got a little bit concerned, I'm like, there's no reason for you to do this. <laughs> you know, have you, have you ever had a kid that's still looking for more? Even though you gave them everything they needed, they're still looking for more. That's how I felt, because I'm like, my goodness, you've not, even, you've not even done the mock exams we gave you. Why are you scouring the internet for free questions? Why? Do you want to harm yourself? Don't you know there's poison in that stuff? True story. I end up getting these mock exams. And I go through the mock exams and I'm like, oh my gosh. <laughs> I hold my head in disbelief. The very first one that I come across gives me some outlandish 
process name from prehistoric times, from the Pembok guide that even the PMI forgot. I, I probably have the Pembok, yeah, I probably have that edition somewhere in my bookshelf, but the PMI forgot about it because it's asking for something from 10 years ago. I'm like, oh my gosh, where did you get this poison from? I couldn't believe it. I went to the second one. And there in big bold letters at the top was, this is based on the Pembok 4th edition. What? We are, we are on the 6th edition. You're, you're taking stuff into your system from a previous edition? I almost lost it. I almost lost it. I composed an email really quick and, you know, save yourself. <laughs> get, get off this train. This train is leading. This is the train to nowhere. What? Look, this is one of the reasons people fail because they took a mock exam that told them, oh, you're ready. Meanwhile, the mock exam was just absolute rubbish. Not based on the current guide, not even written properly. It, it amazes me how, how people just put their money at risk, hard-earned money at risk. You know? Don't do it. Don't do it. So, please, take mock exams that are tested and tried and have a track record. Mock exams where if you are stuck on a question, you can ask a human that will actually respond to you. Because a lot of people are taking these goofy old mocks that are worse than poison. Fourth edition? Are you kidding me? Some people even take mocks based on the second edition. You know, it's funny. I heard from a question writer on social media that was saying, it's amazing. This stuff, I created this stuff like over, I don't even remember when, like eons ago. People are still using what I created, even though it's wrong. But there's nothing I can do. People just keep passing it around. Oh, take this link. Watch this. Do this. Honestly, this is your friend Phil keeping it real for you. There's no other channel where it gets as raw as this. Because people don't want to tell it like it is. I don't care. I'll tell you. I want to save you. Don't do it. Please don't do it. People say my funds are low. Yes, okay, funds are low, but that's no reason to get crazy, bad crazy, start doing dumb things that are going to land you in more trouble, make you pay $325 more to the PMI. Don't do it. Please, don't do it. Don't do it. I would rather you took no mock exam than taking contaminated mocks. Enough said. A word is enough for the wise. I'm going to get off my soapbox. Let me see if there are any questions come in or any comments. Any confusion that you need straightening out on. Any questions? Any questions? Go in once. You know if there are no questions, I'll just put you back in smack dab in line with your friend Phil. He'll, he'll just keep talking. We'll get an, another version of Phil. Phil 1.0 or 2.0. We'll, we'll find one. Any questions before we jump off for tonight? Go in once. Go in twice. Go in three times. Well, thank you all very much. The purpose I put this together really was to help people who have not been doing well on the test multiple times. It's always sad to hear when someone put in money, time, attention, put the family on hold. It's, it's very sad, you know, and a lot of people who feel their careers are in the balance. You know, like one student who told me management is demanding, management wants blood. It's just sad. Another student said, Phil, my, my management said I haven't passed the exam. They want their money back for the course. 
the course that I took. It's sad. And that is what drives me to help people pass the exam. That is why I'm always giving tips and tricks and the like. Okay? Well, the videos will keep playing. Don't worry. If you've got questions much later on, you can drop them in. As soon as I'm able, I will respond to you, get you an answer. But for now, I'll leave you in the capable hands of your buddy, Phil. Failing the PMP exam is something you don't want to experience. Lots of money and moreover, a lot of time that you cannot ever regain go down the drain. Once upon a time, there was a student who didn't do too well on the exam. And I was wondering, what can we do to get this student in a better state? So jointly, we came up with this idea of an Excel file that will help track progress, that will help track what happened on the exam and how you can do better. I put together a page called the PMP exam failure stamp out page purposely for people who have failed the PMP exam to help them in their efforts. Speaker, author, and coach to thousands of professionals and organizations worldwide, including NASA, the U.S. Air Force, USACE, U.S. Army, the Department of Transportation, the FBI. Your friend, Phil. Over to you, Phil. Hey, my fellow project managers, I hope you're doing awesome. You've heard it, you've heard it all. I'm telling you, you can pass this exam. But I wanted to add further value to you by just giving you a few ideas about how exam questions can trip you up. And if you have been trying to get certified over and over again without success, I want you to begin to look at questions in a different light. Okay, so this is to give you a more pragmatic way of addressing the problem. Yes, I've given you that page, the stamp out page. Yes, I've given you tips about pages in the PMBOK guide, but I want to focus a little bit on how questions can trip you up. So, a few days ago, I was playing with a few questions, kind of kicking them around back and forth between our students. And I realized that they were getting tripped up by a certain question characteristic. They're getting tripped up on questions that have multiple dimensions. So I want to address this multiple dimension question writing approach that people might be struggling with. Maybe you've come across such a thing as well. This might help you, okay? So the questions are usually you are a project manager doing X, Y, Z. Let me just go to the whiteboard, chart this out a little bit, and you'll get the idea of what I'm trying to say. All right. So it usually starts off like this. You are a project manager. And they usually tell you what you're doing. You are doing that, whatever it is. Okay, we'll just say you're doing, just put X variable. Okay. Now, where I see people beginning to get distracted is when the question shifts into the reasoning behind what you're doing. And I'll explain this in a, in a few seconds. So think about it. You're a project manager, you're doing X. And then the question could follow up in order to achieve why your project manager you're doing X whatever that variable is in order to achieve Y where you will derive 
a variable z. And then a red herring. A red heron is added to the mix. What do I mean? A distractor. So, something to the effect of while you are doing X, you realize a problem which could affect. outcome Z. Are you following the line of thought? Okay, so this is a question with various aspects and variables. If you don't keep your eye on this first one, I'm going to make these different colors Let's make this blue. Let's make this a darker red or brownish. And this, I'll make this green. All right. If you don't keep your eye on the blue, you will get the question wrong. Whatever the question ends up being, if you don't keep your eye on the blue, what you are doing you end up getting the question wrong. The question usually ends with a big finish such as it's usually something to the effect of what should you do next? Are you looking at these variables? Are you seeing how these variables are being set up? You're a project manager, you're doing X. That's, that's the first piece of the question. All right. Now they're beginning to derail you, or let's say beginning to test your focus and your understanding as one of my students former student, now PMP boss, would say, Dre, he would say, they want to find out if you're loyal. <laughs> they, want, they want to find out, are you still loyal to the Pembok Guide? In other words, are you really paying attention to what you are doing as a project manager? And are you really aware of what you should be focusing on as a project manager? You see? So, by the time you get to point two, you're beginning to get a little bit of a pull, a gravitational pull away from one. This is why questions sometimes appear very ambiguous because they put in a number of variables, but it's done in a subtle manner. So your project manager doing X in order to achieve Y, where you will derive Z. So you're doing X because you want to achieve y and from y you're going to derive z whatever that is while you're doing x you realize a problem which could affect outcome z what should you do next let me show you what this question has done this question has taken your focus away from number one what are you doing what should you do next two and three let's put in three three distractor. It said a problem which could affect outcome Z, but still that's not really focusing on I'm doing item one, what should I do next? Item two, what I'm trying to achieve and all these other things, they could be red herrings on the question. Okay, I'm not saying every single question is like this, but I'm trying to show you how your focus could easily be taken away. 
your focus could be taken away from what exactly you should be focusing on. And this is why certain folks may have trouble on the test because your attention is being taken away from the real thing you should be looking at. And I mean, someone could come away thinking, oh, but I answered the question based on three. I realized the problem. And what should I do next? Solve the problem. No. What should you do next could be a number of could do next or should do next. You know, the question could be fine-tuned to say, Which process should you do next? Or it could just be a what should you do next? But you don't want to lose sight of the first point. I realized that questions like this were throwing my students all over the place and they were getting distracted. You know, I think I had, on one question, I had zero correct answers. On some questions, I had like a 60% correct answer. You know, and this is what the PMI does, which is why when the questions are served, just know they've been passed around the block. They've been tested. So by the time the question is coming to you, almost guaranteed, a certain number of people will always get that question wrong because they are focusing on the wrong thing. They're not answering the question, focusing on the first point. They got lost along the way. And this is just one, one scenario. There are many different scenarios I could paint, you know. But the overarching thing is, as you see these questions, do not forget what you are really doing in the very first stage. If you do, you're going to be derailed and you're going to get the question wrong. And, and this is one of the reasons why certain questions are not home runs for people. Okay, so talking about passing the exam, you really need to strategically and intentionally look at the, the moving parts. You, you know, you see a question written as one block, then it shifts to another. You need to feel that shift. You need to know, oh, wait a minute, that question... It's shifted. It, they've moved from what I'm doing to something else. What are they really looking for in the final, you know, the big hurrah at the end? What are they really looking for? When they give you that final line, you can either make or break your experience by following this tip. Don't get lost. Hold on to that first thing. And as you're navigating the question, always remember, you're doing this, you're doing X, you're doing Y, you're doing Z. Still along some rather elementary lines, but nonetheless, something that could help you. You could get questions such as, you are creating or developing a document a document X This document will be used to why? The document can also be used for whatever. You could get a what should you do next based on knowing which document you're working on. Or you could get which tool and technique 
will you use to create X? Something like that. There are many, many ways, you know, if I was a question writer, I could cause a whole lot of havoc just by messing around with these four blocks. One block of what is going on, a second block of what could result from what is going on, and I could even be more malicious as a question writer and I could totally throw you off. I could give you th streams of thought, streams of possibilities that could derail you by giving you candy, PM candy, things that excite you but are just totally irrelevant. Totally irrelevant. Let me give you another example. Another example. Okay, let's look at a scenario whereby you get a question. Here is a network diagram. Okay. There are 12 nodes. One of the nodes, or I should say one of the branches, is hanging. What do I mean by that? Well, if you haven't seen one of those network diagrams with a hanging branch that isn't really joining to the others, it's going off on its own. So there are 12 nodes, one of the branches is hanging. Here are all the activity durations. The customer would like the deliverable on the day you end. Okay, and then it could build on that to say, what is the project slack? If I gave you a big old network diagram with all these fancy arrows and images, that's enough to excite anyone that has studied that. So imagine if I gave you a big old network diagram to go with this. A lot of folks would rub their hands in glee, like I used to in those days. Oh, I've read this. I know this. And start, just go out of the gate and begin to solve that network diagram like a bat being let out of, I don't know where. However... If you read the question carefully, you realize that there's no need for you to solve a single thing. If the customer would like the deliverable on the day you end, then you've got no slack. You've got zero slack. There is absolutely no need for you to start solving anything here. This is an example of where you would do so much work, 10 minutes worth of work, only to realize that there was no point. Another example of such could be, here's a network diagram. There are 12 nodes. One of the branches is hanging. Here are the durations. And then what is the free slack of task A.
task A is the first task. Now, if you get a question like this, again, you could get excited and begin solving till the cows come home. But task A, if it's a, a network diagram where there is, you know, one beginning task, task A, the free slack will be zero. You don't need to solve nothing. It's going to be zero. The same as a task at the end of the chain. It will be zero. So getting all excited and solving this network diagram is only going to waste your time. You, you will get the answer right, but you would have wasted 10 minutes on a network diagram that is asking you what is the free slack of an activity that's on the critical path. Or what is the total slack of an activity on the critical path? Do you see what I'm saying? I'm trying to get you to see these questions for what they are. A lot of these questions, a lot of these questions, they don't need as much effort as people put in. People put in a lot of effort, but unfortunately, they didn't need to. They didn't need to do what they're doing. OK, so I hope this is helping you. I hope this is, you know, kind of turning on the light bulbs bit by bit for you to see that the reasons why certain folks may not do well in a question is not because they haven't studied. It's not because they didn't read. But more than anything else, it's because they are not paying attention to what the question is asking. They might just be in the dark. They may be oblivious. You see, so these are just a few examples of how questions are engineered and how people could totally miss the boat when it comes to answering these questions. So let's uh, have a little recap. First of all, I gave you the breakdown of X. You're doing X in order to achieve Y. That just showed you red herrings could be deliberately placed in questions. It's testing your loyalty, like Dre said. You know. Secondly, you could be given a oh, you're creating this document or you're creating this plan. You know, which tool and technique would you use to create this plan or that thing? And you'll be given a tool and technique that maps back to the process where that thing is created or where that thing is done. And then I'm giving you some more problem-oriented, formula-oriented type question. It looks formula-oriented on the surface or technical on the surface, but it's really logic, you know. So you got to get your logic game up. When it comes to network diagrams, you got to know the definitions inside out to know when logic is needed to solve the problem versus a calculator, a calculator. So don't make the mistake of wasting time on questions where the answer is staring at you in the face. On the critical path, you got zero, zero slack, zero float in all of the activities, free float, total float. If the end date of the project is the same as customer required due date as in the previous one, zero project float. So you got to know the theory behind whatever you're doing okay don't just read blindly but know the theory okay and practice questions that are tested and tried you know I tell people don't just jump on these ridiculously cheap free mock exams on the internet no I didn't say companies I'm talking about people that just go to the internet and do a search. What is wrong with you? Are you kidding me? You're, you're playing with your $555 by searching for these crummy questions on the internet. And you're jubilating that you found a treasure trove of rubbish on the internet. Seriously, don't do it. If you haven't heard it before, there's a lot of poison out there. I'm amazed, watch this, a student jubilated about finding four mock exams on the web. I got a little bit concerned, I'm like, there's no reason for you to do this, <laughs> you know, have you, have you ever had 
a kid that's still looking for more even though you gave them everything they needed they're still looking for more that's how i felt because i'm like my goodness you've not even you've not even done the mock exams we gave you why are you scouring the internet for free questions why do you want to harm yourself don't you know there's poison in that stuff true story i end up getting these mock exams and i go through the mock exams and i'm like oh my gosh <laughs> i hold my head in disbelief the very first one that i come across gives me some outlandish process name from prehistoric times from the pembok guide that even the pmi forgot i i probably have the pembok yeah, I probably have that edition somewhere in my bookshelf, but the PMI forgot about it because it's asking for something from 10 years ago. I'm like, oh my gosh, where did you get this poison from? I couldn't believe it. I went to the second one and there in big bold letters at the top was, this is based on the Pembok 4th edition what we we are on the sixth edition you're you're taking stuff into your system from a previous edition i almost lost it i almost lost it i composed an email really quick and you know save yourself <laughs> get get off this train this train is leading this is the train to nowhere what look this is one of the reasons people fail because they took a mock exam that told them oh you're ready meanwhile the mock exam was just absolute rubbish not based on the current guide not even written properly it, it amazes me how how people just put their money at risk hard-earned money at risk you know don't do it don't do it so please take mock exams that are tested and tried and have a track record mock exams where if you are stuck on a question you can ask a human that will actually respond to you because a lot of people are taking these goofy old mocks that are worse than poison fourth edition are you kidding me some people even take mocks based on the second edition you know it's funny i heard from a question writer on social media that was saying it's amazing this stuff i created this stuff like over i don't even remember when like eons ago people are still using what i created even though it's wrong but there's nothing i can do people just keep passing it around oh take this link watch this do this honestly this is your friend Phil keeping it real for you. There's no other channel where it gets as raw as this. Because people don't want to tell it like it is. I don't care. I'll tell you. I want to save you. Don't do it. Please don't do it. People say my funds are low. Yes, okay, funds are low. But that's no reason to get crazy. Bad crazy start doing dumb things that are going to land you in more trouble make you pay 325 dollars more to the pmi don't do it please don't do it don't do it i would rather you took no mock exam than taking contaminated mocks enough said a word is enough for the wise i'm going to get off my soapbox let me see if there are any questions come in or any comments any confusion that you need straightening out on any questions any questions go in once you know if there are no questions i just put you back in smack dab in line with your friend phil he'll, he'll just keep talking we'll get an, another version of phil phil 1.0 or 2.0 we'll, we'll find one any questions before we jump off for tonight? Go in once. Go in twice.
go in three times. Well, thank you all very much. The purpose I put this together really was to help people who have not been doing well on the test multiple times. It's always sad to hear when someone put in money, time, attention, put the family on hold. It's, it's very sad, you know, and a lot of people who feel their careers are in the balance, you know, like one student who told me management is demanding, management wants blood. It's just sad. Another student said, Phil, my, my management said I haven't passed the exam. They want their money back for the course, the course that I took. It's sad. And that is what drives me to help people pass the exam. That is why I'm always giving tips and tricks and the like. Okay? Well, the videos will keep playing. Don't worry. If you've got questions much later on, you can drop them in. As soon as I'm able, I will respond to you, get you an answer. But for now, I'll leave you in the capable hands of your buddy, Phil. Failing the PMP exam is something you don't want to experience. Lots of money and moreover, a lot of time that you cannot ever regain go down the drain. Once upon a time, there was a student who didn't do too well on the exam. And I was wondering, what can we do to get this student in a better state. So jointly, we came up with this idea of an Excel file that will help track progress, that will help track what happened on the exam and how you can do better. I put together a page called the PMP exam failure stamp out page, purposely for people who have failed the PMP exam to help them in their efforts. Speaker, author, and coach to thousands of professionals and organizations worldwide, including NASA, the U.S. Air Force, USACE, U.S. Army, the Department of Transportation, the FBI. Your friend, Phil. Over to you, Phil. Hey, my fellow project managers, I hope you're doing awesome. You've heard it, you've heard it all. I'm telling you, you can pass this exam. But I wanted to add further value to you by just giving you a few ideas about how exam questions can trip you up. And if you have been trying to get certified over and over again without success, I want you to begin to look at questions in a different light. Okay, so this is to give you a more pragmatic way of addressing the problem. Yes, I've given you that page, the stamp out page. Yes, I've given you tips about pages in the PMBOK guide, but I want to focus a little bit on how questions can trip you up. So a few days ago, I was playing with a few questions, kind of kicking them around back and forth between our students. And I realized that they were getting tripped up by a certain question characteristic. They're getting tripped up on questions that have multiple dimensions. So I want to address this multiple dimension question writing approach that people might be struggling with. Maybe you've come across such a thing as well. This might help you, okay? So, the questions are usually, you are a project manager doing X, Y, Z. Let me just go to the whiteboard, chart this out a little bit, and you'll get the idea of what I'm trying to say. All right. So it usually starts off like this. You are a project manager. And they usually tell you what you're doing. You are doing that, whatever it is. Okay, we'll just say you're doing, just put X variable. Okay. Now, where I see people beginning to get distracted is when the question shifts into the reasoning 
behind what you're doing. And I'll explain this in a, in a few seconds. So think about it. You're a project manager, you're doing X. And then the question could follow up in order to achieve Y. You're a project manager, you're doing X, whatever that variable is, in order to achieve Y, where you will derive a variable Z. And then a red herring. A red herring is added to the mix. What do I mean? A distractor. So, sum it to the effect of while you are doing X, you realize a problem. which could affect outcome Z. Are you following the line of thought? OK. So this is a question with various aspects and variables. If you don't keep your eye on this first one, I'm going to make these different colors. Let's make this blue. Let's make this a darker red or brownish. And this, I'll make this green. All right. If you don't keep your eye on the blue, you will get the question wrong. Whatever the question ends up being, if you don't keep your eye on the blue, what you are doing, you end up getting the question wrong. The question usually ends with a big finish such as, it's usually something to the effect of, What should you do next? Are you looking at these variables? Are you seeing how these variables are being set up? You're a project manager, you're doing X. That's, that's the first piece of the question. All right. Now they're beginning to derail you, or let's say beginning to test your focus and your understanding, as one of my students, former student, now PMP boss, would say, Dre, he would say, they want to find out if you're loyal. <laughs> they, want, they want to find out, are you still loyal to the PMBOK guide? In other words, are you really paying attention to what you are doing as a project manager? And are you really aware of what you should be focusing on as a project manager? You see? So by the time you get to point two, you're beginning to get a little bit of a pull, a gravitational pull away from one. This is why questions sometimes appear very ambiguous, because they put in a number of variables, but it's done in a subtle manner. So your project manager doing X, in order to achieve Y, where you will derive Z. So you're doing X because you want to achieve Y. And from Y, you're going to derive Z, whatever that is. While you're doing X, you realize a problem which could affect outcome Z. What should you do next? Let me show you what this question has done. This question has taken your focus away from number one. 
what are you doing? What should you do next? Two and three, let's put in three. Three, distractor. It said a problem which could affect outcome Z, but still, that's not really focusing on, I'm doing item one, what should I do next? Item two, what I'm trying to achieve, and all these other things, they could be red herrings on the question, okay? I'm not saying every single question is like this, but I'm trying to show you how your focus could easily be taken away. Your focus could be taken away from what exactly you should be focusing on. And this is why certain folks may have trouble on the test because your attention is being taken away from the real thing you should be looking at. And I mean, someone could come away thinking, oh, but I answered the question based on three. I realized the problem. And what should I do next? Solve the problem. No. What should you do next could be a number of could do next or should do next. You know, the question could be fine-tuned to say, which process should you do next? Or it could just be a what should you do next? But you don't want to lose sight of the first point. I realized that questions like this were throwing my students all over the place and they were getting distracted. You know, I think I had, on one question, I had zero correct answers. On some questions, I had like a 60% correct answer. You know, and this is what the PMI does, which is why when the questions are served, just know they've been passed around the block. They've been tested. So by the time the question is coming to you, almost guaranteed a certain number of people will always get that question wrong because they are focusing on the wrong thing. They're not answering the question, focusing on the first point. They got lost along the way. And this is just one one scenario there are many different scenarios I could paint you know but the overarching thing is as you see these questions do not forget what you are really doing in the very first stage if you do you're gonna be derailed and you're gonna get the question wrong and and this is one of the reasons why certain questions are not home runs for people okay so talking about passing the exam you really need to strategically and intentionally look at the the moving parts you, you know you see a question written as one block then it shifts to another you need to feel that shift you need to know oh wait a minute that question it shifted it they've moved from what I'm doing to something else what are they really looking for in the final you know, the big hurrah at the end. What are they really looking for? When they give you that final line, you can either make or break your experience by following this tip. Don't get lost. Hold on to that first thing. And as you're navigating the question, always remember, you're doing this. You're doing this. You're doing Y. You're doing Z. Still along some rather elementary lines, but nonetheless, something that could help you. You could get questions such as, you are creating or developing a document A document X.
this document will be used to Y. The document can also be used for whatever. You could get a what should you do next based on knowing which document you're working on or you could get which tool and technique will you use to create X. Something like that. There are many, many ways, you know, if I was a question writer, I could cause a whole lot of havoc just by messing around with these four blocks. One block of what is going on, a second block of what could result from what is going on, and I could even be more malicious as a question writer and I could totally throw you off. I could give you th streams of thought, streams of possibilities that could derail you by giving you candy, PM candy, things that excite you but are just totally irrelevant. Totally irrelevant. Let me give you another example. Another example. Okay, let's look at a scenario whereby you get a question. Here is a network diagram. Okay. There are 12 nodes. One of the nodes, or I should say one of the branches, is hanging. What do I mean by that? Well, if you haven't seen one of those network diagrams with a hanging branch that isn't really joining to the others, it's going off on its own. So there are 12 nodes, one of the branches is hanging. Here are all the activity durations. The customer would like the deliverable on the day you end. Okay, and then it could build on that to say, what is the project slack? If I gave you a big old network diagram with all these fancy arrows and images, that's enough to excite anyone that has studied that. So imagine if I gave you a big old network diagram to go with this. A lot of folks would rub their hands in glee, like I used to in those days. Oh, I've read this. I know this. And start, just go out of the gate and begin to solve that network diagram like a bat being let out of I don't know where. However... If you read the question carefully, you realize that there's no need for you to solve a single thing. If the customer would like the deliverable on the day you end, then you've got no slack. You've got zero slack. There is absolutely no need 
for you to start solving anything here. This is an example of where you would do so much work, 10 minutes worth of work, only to realize that there was no point. Another example of such could be, here's a network diagram. There are 12 nodes. One of the branches is hanging. Here are the durations. And then, what is the free slack of task A? Task A is the first task. Now, if you get a question like this, again, you could get excited and begin solving till the cows come home, but task A, if it's a, a network diagram where there is, you know, one beginning task, task A, the free slack will be zero. You don't need to solve nothing. It's going to be zero. The same as a task at the end of the chain. It will be zero. So getting all excited and solving this network diagram is only going to waste your time you, you will get the answer right, but you would have wasted 10 minutes on a network diagram that is asking you what is the free slack of an activity that's on the critical path, or what is the total slack of an activity on the critical path. Do you see what I'm saying? I'm trying to get you to see these questions for what they are. A lot of these questions, a lot of these questions, they don't need as much effort as people put in. People put in a lot of effort, but unfortunately, they didn't need to. They didn't need to do what they're doing. Okay? So I hope this is helping you. I hope this is, you know, kind of turning on the light bulbs bit by bit for you to see that the reasons why certain folks may not do well in a question is not because they haven't studied. It's not because they didn't read, but more than anything else, it's because they are not paying attention to what the question is asking. They might just be in the dark. They may be oblivious, you see. So these are just a few examples of how questions are engineered and how people could totally miss the boat when it comes to answering these questions. So let's uh, have a little recap. First of all, I gave you the breakdown of X. You're doing X in order to achieve Y. That just showed you red herrings could be deliberately placed in questions. It's testing your loyalty, like Dre said. You know. Secondly, you could be given a, oh, you're creating this document or you're creating this plan. You know, which tool and technique would you use to create this plan or that thing and you'll be given a tool and technique that maps back to the process where that thing is created or where that thing is done and then I'm giving you some more problem oriented formula oriented type question it looks formula oriented on the surface or technical on the surface but it's really logic you know so you got to get your logic game up. When it comes to network diagrams, you got to know the definitions inside out to know when logic is needed to solve the problem versus a calculator. A calculator. So don't make the mistake of wasting time on questions where the answer is staring at you in the face. On the critical path, you got zero zero slack, zero float in all of the activities, free float, total float. If the end date of the project is the same as customer required due date, as in the previous one, zero project float. So you got to know the theory behind whatever you're doing, okay? Don't just read blindly, but know the theory, okay? And practice questions that are tested and tried you know I tell people don't just jump on these ridiculously cheap free mock exams on the internet no I didn't say companies 
I'm talking about people that just go to the internet and do a search. What is wrong with you? Are you kidding me? You're, you're playing with your $555 by searching for these crummy questions on the internet. And you're jubilating that you found a treasure trove of rubbish on the internet. Seriously, don't do it. If you haven't heard it before, there's a lot of poison out there. I'm amazed. Watch this. A student jubilated about finding four mock exams on the web. I got a little bit concerned. I'm like, there's no reason for you to do this. <laughs> you know, have you, have you ever had a kid that's still looking for more? Even though you gave them everything they needed, they're still looking for more. That's how I felt. Because I'm like, my goodness, you've not even you've not even done the mock exams we gave you. Why are you scouring the internet for free questions? Why? Do you want to harm yourself? Don't you know there's poison in that stuff? True story. I end up getting these mock exams. And I go through the mock exams and I'm like, Oh, oh my gosh. <laughs> I hold my head in disbelief. The very first one that I come across gives me some outlandish process name from prehistoric times, from the Pembok guide that even the PMI forgot. I, I probably have the Pembok, yeah, I probably have that edition somewhere in my bookshelf, but the PMI forgot about it because it's asking for something from 10 years ago. I'm like, oh my gosh, where did you get this poison from? I couldn't believe it. I went to the second one and there in big bold letters at the top was, this is based on the Pembok 4th edition. What? We are, we are on the 6th edition. You're you're taking stuff into your system from a previous edition? I almost lost it. I almost lost it. I composed an email really quick and, you know, save yourself. <laughs> get, get off this train. This train is leading. This is a train to nowhere. What? Look, this is one of the reasons people fail because they took a mock exam that told them, oh, you're ready. Meanwhile, the mock exam was just absolute rubbish. Not based on the current guide. Not even written properly. It, it amazes me how, how people just put their money at risk. Hard-earned money at risk. You know? Don't do it. Don't do it. So, please, take mock exams that are tested and tried and have a track record. Mock exams where if you are stuck on a question, you can ask a human that will actually respond to you. Because a lot of people are taking these goofy old mocks that are worse than poison. Fourth edition? Are you kidding me? Some people even take mocks based on the second edition. You know, it's funny. I heard from a question writer on social media that was saying it's amazing this stuff I created this stuff like over I don't even remember when like eons ago people are still using what I created even though it's wrong but there's nothing I can do people just keep passing it around oh take this link watch this do this honestly this is your friend Phil keeping it real for you there's no other channel where it gets as raw as this. Because people don't want to tell it like it is. I don't care. I'll tell you. I want to save you. Don't do it. Please don't do it. People say my funds are low. Yes, okay, funds are low. But that's no reason to get crazy, bad crazy, start doing dumb things that are going to land you in more trouble make you pay $325 more to the PMI. Don't do it. Please, don't do it. Don't do it. I would rather you took no mock exam than taking contaminated mocks. Enough said. A word is enough for the wise.
I'm going to get off my soapbox. Let me see if there are any questions come in or any comments. Any confusion that you need straightening out on? Any questions? Any questions? Go in once. You know if there are no questions, I'll just put you back in smack dab in line with your friend Phil. He'll, he'll just keep talking. We'll get an, another version of Phil. Phil 1.0 or 2.0. We'll, we'll find one. Any questions before we jump off for tonight? No, Phil. I don't think they got questions. Let me, let me just take over from here, Phil. So what I wanted to talk to everyone about next is actually the big wrap-up. So our students that got done on Saturday, I know some of them drop by every now and again and are listening to the channel because we got done with this boot camp on, on the 17th of August. So I know a lot of folks who attended that boot camp might be watching. Well, it's a reminder. You know, I like giving people seven reminders because, as they say, you need to listen to stuff seven times or even more before it sticks. <laughs> I don't know about you. How many times have you needed to listen to the Pembok guy before it finally stuck? Well, Honestly, there's stuff in the Pembok Guide I'm still discovering. Seriously, I'm still learning about it. So this is our wrap up, you know, some of the things we talked about, but I want to reiterate them. And I also want to talk about my lessons learned from the PMP exam and, and what I learned and how it started and my preparation and all that. So the final point for those people who have taken our uh, boot camp, uh, you can pass the test, all right? You need to know you can do it. Take it from me. If your friend Phil could do it over a decade ago in 2005, you can do it. You can. I didn't have the support of a coach like myself. I didn't have that training. I did have a mentor who guided me to the water, but I didn't have anyone to usher me through it. You see, now you got your friend Phil trying to stop you from making dumb mistakes he did. So now you know what to expect. And it's not about now. So the mock exam that you take, the mock exams you take, let me tell you straight up, my friends, it's not about now. It is not about now. So don't feel bad if you did not pass the mock exam. In fact, you should be jubilating. You should be saying, woohoo! <laughs> I I beat the PMI to their game. The PMI they were trying to they're trying to catch me, but instead I'm catching them. That's what you need to be thinking. You need to be feeling good that you're not going to make those dumb mistakes. You see why? Because you are finding out the mistakes as you're taking this mock exam. You get what I'm saying? So it's not about now. It's it's all about closing the gaps right now. That's what it's about. The story continues later. You see, the PMP exam is not about now. It's all about what you eventually will do later. So there are many things to think about when it comes to, to the perspective, you know, the perspective you're looking at the exam. Today is important. You're building for tomorrow. Later on, you're going to show the PMI. You've done your homework. You've closed the gaps and so on. Don't start feeling you know, bad. Oh, I, I failed a mock exam. It's ridiculous because you can always close those gaps. Does that make sense? Okay. So it's not about how badly you did now. It's about how you're going to close the gaps for later. Okay. And trust me, they're waiting at the crossroads. PMI, they're waiting to see, did you close the gaps? Did you close the gaps? You see, it's all about passing the exam later. The mock exam is not a verdict. If you got a 50, a 40, who cares? Who cares you got a 40 on the mock exam? It's not something for you to cry about. I mean, I've had some students to the point, they're almost feeling like they've been beaten up. What's wrong with you? Come, You know, get off that horse of, I'm the best in the world and I can never fail. How are you going to learn if you don't fail? A lot of people are in, in that mode of, oh, I failed. You should be happy you failed. It's not a final verdict. It's part of your roadmap to success. You know what a lot of people don't want to do? They don't want to retake the mock. That's the problem. Retake the mock. Okay. I talked about study groups earlier. Now you've been for training. Form alliances. Not the other way around. Some people are forming alliances and thinking that's all they need. 
No, it was good you came for the boot camp because now that has put you and your peers on the same plane. So all those folks you met in my boot camp on those Saturdays that are on our group on Facebook, you need to be connecting with those folks. Have a study group. Have a study buddy. We listened to one of our students about nine months ago, Rene. He came on and I asked him, what was one of the best things ever that propelled you to success? He said, Phil, it was my study buddy. Without my study buddy, I would not have taken the exam. I would not have taken the exam at this time. And the irony is that his study buddy had not taken the exam, did not take the exam until months after him. But they both succeeded, you see. As it says, iron sharpens iron. You know, a scripture that says iron sharpens iron. you got to have someone to sharpen you. Otherwise, you're just going to be going on your own thinking that you're sharp. Meanwhile, you're not. So when you have a study buddy, not only do they motivate you, not only do they propel you to excellence, they also get you to the finish line because they keep on asking you, oh, I'm doing this this time. Have you done that? When are you doing it? And so on and so forth. I talk about one of our students here quite a lot, and you've heard her, uh, Shri, but you've also heard me talk about LTC Hayward, Lieutenant Colonel Hayward, our U.S. Army. Well, both Shri and LTC were in my class, and it got to a point, they're like, you know what, we should probably meet and have some study sessions and try and get over some of these ridiculous mock exams that Phil has put out. <laughs> they both did that, and they are both now bosses. They're both now PMPs. I'm telling you, teamwork makes the dream work. Just get with that study buddy. Work as a team. It does wonders. It really does. Take all the quizzes and the tests that we've exposed you to, and you'll be good. Now, this right here is one of my students. This slide is all about Sarah, one of my rock stars from Pepperdine University. Why am I showing you Sarah? Because she was one of the folks who took a mock exam and felt, oh, I could have done much better. But what did she do? She didn't get the highest in the mock in that class, but she went back and closed all her gaps and then returned with a vengeance passed the mock, and then called me one day and said, Phil, I think I'm ready. She really worked hard. She was actually the first student out of that class at Pepperdine to get certified. But what you can learn from Sarah is she did not give up. Not passing the mock did not throw her off. She said, you know what? I'm going to study. I'm going to get this done. I'm going to drive it all the way to the end. So when she calls me a few days before and says, can you test me? Because I usually give my students a quick tie kick and find out if they're ready. I'm giving her this test, and she's returning fire for fire. I'm asking her the toughest questions I have, and she's replying. I'm like, Sarah, what on earth are you talking about? You, you, how can you tell me you're not ready? You don't feel ready. Of course you're ready. So long story short, she goes away, passes the exam, four proficients. In other words, four above targets. This is someone who felt she wasn't ready. This student, Steve Shaw, this is how to have the pen book for lunch, pretty much. This is Steve's dining table, right? If you take a close look at what he's doing here, he took over the table, put butcher paper over the whole thing. <laughs> Poor family can't eat. Can't eat until he's done eating his pen book. But you can see all of the processes there. You see all of those processes, and then he's showing you the outputs and how those become inputs. It looks like one big old spaghetti diagram. Really deep into the guide. And then if you zero in, you can see right there his extract of the PMBOK guide where he is zeroing in on the data flow for one process. And that's what he did, building on data flows. You see all these, these markers, different colors? That's how deep he went. He wasn't the first person to get the mock exam down. He did not get the highest mock exam score. And I can tell you, some folks pass the mock exam, but they have not gotten certified as quickly as he did, you see. In fact, some are still not certified, and they pass the mock. So you can learn a lot from, from these students. These are people who have gone above and beyond. Now, for me, my lessons learned. Hmm, how I passed the exam, how did it start? Well, it started off with my mentor, a lady called Mary Hirschner, out of Arizona. We worked on the same project. She was actually contracting with the government, well, 
working for a company that was contracted to the government. We were working for the government on an engineering project. And she just said, Phil, hey, I think you'll be a good candidate for this. And she, she said, hey, here are my books. Go on, go on, you know, go on, do it, do it, Phil. That's, that, that's what she did. Just gave me all her books and, and Pembok Guide and, and believe that I think you'll be, you will be a good candidate for this. I don't know what it was she saw. Maybe I was a, a bit too passionate about project management, but she said, yeah, you will be a good candidate for this. Anyway, very selfless act, kept on motivating and encouraging. She said, no, that's fine. When you get done, you return it to me. She gave me everything she had to study because she was now PMP. Little did she know <laughs> that I was going to take it to the nth degree. Well, Mary poured and poured so much wisdom and talk about a project management junkie talk about it talk about a covert project management junkie because that's really what mary is but she comes across as being not that much of a junkie at first until she starts talking about ms project and then when she starts talking about ms project you know oh my goodness she is she has drunk the kool-aid so she inspired me not only to take the pmp exam I also ended up taking the uh, PMISP exam because she took it. And then I said, you know what? I'm going to take it. And then she took the, uh, what do you call it? Microsoft Project, um, Microsoft, Microsoft Certified Technology Specialist Certification. Um, and that inspired me to do likewise. So I took that. But I think at the end of the day, Mary outdid me. But the, the bottom line is Mary encouraged me to look into the PMP exam. Very good uh, mentor and, and someone who motivated me and still motivates me and encourages me and also was um, instrumental to um, some of the, the um, writings of my book, Project Management, Mid-Level to C-Level. Anyway, long story short, she encouraged me to do it. So I began preparing with what Mary gave me. I did my daily ritual, went through, listened to the audio CDs that she gave me, listened to audio around the clock. You know, I would be in line for coffee at, at places like, I'm not going to give them any publicity, like um, my local coffee house. <laughs> I'll, I'll be in line for coffee there and I'll bring out my, at the time, Blackberry and I'll be looking at my Blackberry and trying to get some of the notes, trying to extract some of the notes. All those quizzes Mary gave me, I would take them. I would get into the daily ritual, watching videos that I could. You know, there were not a lot of videos, but I would scour the, the whole web. I mean, back in the day in 2005, you didn't have people like like Phil and, and many others putting out stuff like this. You know, it was hard to find any education on the web that was free. I mean, the guy I bought an additional study guide from, um, which, by the way, I, I didn't need it. It's a good lesson. Don't buy too many books, but I didn't need it. But anyway... Ended up getting this study guide from this guy. And I mean, he was like a mini god. He was like, you know, oh, he's passed the exam because there weren't that many people that had passed. So it was hard to get that knowledge, you know, that whether explicit or tacit knowledge regarding the exam was hard. And uh, Mary was in a different office. I would see her like every week. But I foolishly did not pull her in enough. I thought, you know, if I fail this exam, I don't I, I don't want her to know that I took it, <laughs> which was foolish. Ask for help if you do. So I, I didn't really ask Mary for enough help. She could have mentored me and done more than what she did. But I didn't ask, you know, that thing of, oh, I want to take it. And when I pass it, I'll let her know. Even though she gave me the books, it was just silly. But anyway, I, I did all my stuff on my own, did my daily rituals, would wake up in the morning, listen to audio. I drank the Kool-Aid. I was a maniac for studying. Seriously. I would go to the library with, with a lot of happiness. I would open up the guide, you know, and I fell flat because I was reading a wrong Pembok guide. It was a second edition I should have been reading. But you know that thing where PMI comes out with one edition and they're not really done with the previous one? That's what happened. So I ended up reading the third edition almost a quarter of the way. <laughs> and then I'm like, oh, my goodness, everything's wrong. You know, then I, I, I was totally clueless. So I went back to the drawing board, started again, studied and um, I found myself on the road in my project management job. I worked for an IT firm out in Phoenix. So I had these occasional trips and I would use the trips to study, but I'll also use the trip as a crutch, as an excuse. So I'd use the trip as an excuse to move out the exam. So I became very skilled, very, very, very skilled. I became so skilled at moving out my PMP exam. I would move it out 
in a tactical fashion, as I see the date approaching, as I see that date nearing, I will begin to tell myself in my head, Phil, mm -mm, you can't do it. Remember you were on the road last week? You need to recover from being on the road. Don't do it. Move the exam out. And I would move the exam. <laughs> I would move it. Because in those days, the PMI didn't have you pay the $70 fee for moving the exam um, if you were less than 30 days out. The, I mean, you could move the exam like four days, three days. But I think the PMI began to realize, hmm, there are people like Phil who, who will end up not taking this thing if we just left him to do. But apart from that, it throws the exam test centers off because they, they plan in advance and then you, you're not showing up. And then if you do that in large quantities, it just becomes a, a, a dog and pony show to move stuff. So that's why you pay the inconvenience fee. I can totally understand why the PMI um, are requesting that you do that. So anyway, long story short, after months, you got to remember, I started preparing in January 2005. That's when Mary gave me her books. And that's when I started going through uh, the content, not only in the PMBOK guide, but um, in the study guide she gave me and in the CDs she gave me and all that stuff. So I started combing through the stuff. And then it got to the point I was sick of myself for telling myself about four times, Phil, you're not ready. No, don't do it. I, have you ever gotten so sick of procrastinating that you just had to shut your voice down? I had to shut myself down. I said, Phil, I don't care. Whatever you say, you will take this exam on this date in June. June 25th, 2005, you're going to face the music. You're going to smell the coffee. I am not letting you off the hook again. You cannot keep me like a hamster in the wheel, running around and round like an idiot, preparing ad nauseum. No, I am done. You're going for the exam, Phil. So I gave myself a talking to, scheduled my exam, stuck to my guns, and nothing was going to move me. I was going to face the music on that day. I was going to take the exam. No more excuses. Some of you are like me, you know, how I was back then. Now I'm, I'm very, very reckless, but calculated recklessness when it comes to taking these PMI exams because I'm, I, I know myself. I know I will procrastinate. I know I will drag it out. You know, my last exam was the ACP exam. You know, I dragged it out till like two days before giving myself excuses. Oh, I'm not ready. I said, Phil, you're going in there. So go in there, I did. So how was my PMP exam? Oh my goodness. Talk about lots of crazy experiences. I had a boatload of crazy experiences. Where do I even start from? Well, first of all, I tried to get to the exam venue like way in advance. In fact, I think I went out a few days before, met the good people. It was, um, I believe it was on uh, Bethany Home Road. Um, in Phoenix, Arizona at that time was Prometric. The people were nice, went in there. He seemed to kind of enjoy showing me what, what I was going to be facing. I didn't know, you know, he might have been a sadist for all I know because he was really excited. And little did I know that I was like a lamb being led to the slaughter. So I was really happy and excited as well. And he showed me, he said, oh, you got to lock stuff up here. You can't take food in. Uh, here's a cubicle. We'll give you one of these. He, I mean, those folks were very nice. Now, I don't know what Pearson is doing. I don't know what Pearson View is doing. Um, I haven't gotten enough feedback to, to build conclusions. But um, I've heard that the test centers are nice. I've heard they're modern. But um, I don't know if they'll give you an advanced tour like Prometric used to. They're, they're really nice with that. So anyway, the day of the exam, I now go in. I meet the same people. You know, he told me specifically about my ID. Hey, make not just credit card. Make sure you come with a government-issued ID and all that. So anyway, going to the exam shows me where I'm going. I, I, I'm so excited because I'm used to the, the center a little bit. I drove there the days before. Boom, found myself in front of the exam rubbing my hands in glee, you know. So if you're like me, you've been down a kind of academic life. You've done a first degree, a second degree. You've written papers and dissertations to get through. You, you, you kind of get excited a little bit about, yeah, it's an opportunity for me to show what I can do. Bring it on, PMI. 
show me that first question. And then the first question comes hurtly around the bend. What? What's this? No, 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 no. This, this, oh, oh, I see, I see. This right here, <laughs> this right here must be one of PMI's pretest questions. Ah, okay. All right, I, I'm, I, I'm not going to take this too seriously. I'm going to try and answer it. So I try my best and then I move to the second one. Second question looks like nothing I've ever seen in any mock exam, ever. Never seen anything like this. What on earth am I doing here? Come on now. I ain't even got a clue. What, what are they even asking, by the way? What are they even asking me to do? So I now begin to mark my question. So I mark question two. I mark question three. I mark question four. By the time I get to question five, I'm like, am I in the wrong exam? Really? And my head begins to pound. I'm on question seven, mind you. I crawl through question seven, question eight, crawl through question eight. Question nine hits me like a scud missile. And I'll take a breather for a second and I'm like, what's going on here? This isn't how it's supposed to turn out. Question 10, 11, 12, and 13 in quick succession just floor me like a lightweight, like I've done nothing. I eventually get to question 20 and look at the time. I look at the time and it's showing me 60 minutes have gone by. What? 60 minutes? Seriously? At that point, my countenance changes to something that looks like this. <laughs> my countenance changes to looking like someone who's been deserted on an island somewhere, never to be found again. So at that point, I tell myself, Phil, this is it. You probably shouldn't have listened to Mary. She tried her best. She believed in you, but look at where you are now. So my countenance at that point is just, I'm just so sad and mad. How can I find myself in a condition like this? This isn't the way it's supposed to turn out. So at that point, I begin crafting my PMP exam eulogy. The student who was bold, Brave in battle, but vanquished. <laughs> the PMP student who tried his best, but he was, he was beat, beaten up badly. So at question 20, I now, I, I now begin to craft, okay, this is how I'm going to tell Mary I failed. This is how I'm going to tell family and friends I failed. I'll give them some excuses. And then all of a sudden, all of a sudden, that conspiracy theorist, we all have a little bit of conspiracy theorist in us, right? That conspiracy theorist gremlin that was inside jumped on my shoulder and said, Phil, I know what's going on. It's the PMI. They are sending you questions based on what you got wrong in question one. I'm like, huh, I see. So you mean they're doing some conditional stuff? I'm going to beat them to their game. Instead of going from question 20 to 21, I'm going to fool them. Because this is what they're doing. They're giving me questions based on my failures. I'm going to question 200. I'm going to bypass all the other questions. And whoever is on that end trying to send me dumb questions based on what I got wrong, I am gonna, I'm, I'm going to beat them to their game. And I'm going to find my gimmies by going to question 200. <laughs> oh, dear. I was so paranoid. But do you know? That paranoia, it actually worked because I was so paranoid that I decided to do something different. 
So I went to question 200, and that's when I started working backwards. Question 200. 199, 198, 197, 196. Wait a minute, I'm getting these right. 195, 194, question 175, question 150. Blowing the questions down. Oh my goodness, I could not believe how the exam changed in the blink of an eye. Now, you need to remember I had done 200 questions in the past. None of these 200 questions I had done in the past looked like what I was seeing until I jumped to question 200 and then they started looking a little bit more familiar, a little bit more bearable. I ended up getting to question 120. I think I had gone about another hour. I got to question 120 and then I went another hour and then I got to around question 75 and then the final hour I went from question 75 backwards to question 20 where all my life or death questioning started. Am I going to fail? What should I do? Long story short, my friends, when I got to question 20 backwards, it was 3 hours and 55 minutes. So I had used 3 hours and 55 minutes taking the PMP exam, but I hadn't even gone backwards to look at what I had done. I had marked some. It got to the point where I was like, Phil, if you change anything now, I don't even know if you finish. Say your last prayers. Leave it alone. Say your last prayers. You've only got five minutes left. Don't do anything stupid. Just leave it and go. So instead of checking my, my questions, I just left it. And then I went, I, I, I just hit the end button. I said, no, it's, it's this or never. Hit the end button and the screen goes blank. If you've ever taken any of the PMI exams, you know what I'm talking about. The screen goes blank for what seems to be an eternity. And here I am looking at the screen, and it's just going round and round and round and round and round and round. And then all of a sudden, you've been selected for a survey. We would like to find out. Did you enjoy the exam experience? Did you like the venue? Did you like the staff? Was it clean? <sighs> oh, my goodness. These folks, you want to kill someone? I'm just done with this exam. You're asking me all these dumb questions. But then again, the conspiracy theorist gremlin leapt on my shoulder and said, Phil, if you don't answer positively, you'll fail. <laughs> so I begin saying, did you like the, the venue? Yes. Were you happy? Yes. Yes. Everything? Yes. 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 Already. And I'll hit the end button. The screen goes blank again. Not that long. But then he comes up with, congrats. You have passed the PMP exam. The facial expression then changes from one of annoyance, <laughs> madness, to one of, of, of great joy. Seriously. <sighs> Taking that exam, I mean, passing it, I can't, I can't explain. I can't explain the joy. I can't explain it. Because what I went through in that exam, I don't want anyone else to ever have to go through it. My students, my worst enemy, I wouldn't wish that on them. <laughs> I would probably opt for something else, but not that. No, oh, that was a tough experience, man. It was tough. It was. It was tough. And you know, the, the thing about the PMP exam is it costs money. So you got the monetary bits at stake, and then you're thinking, how am I going to do all of these crazy things all over again? Go to the library, do this, do that. That's why when people come at me saying, fail, I fail the exam, I'm savage with them because I want them to pass it on their next try. I don't want them to have to go through it again and again. Let's do it the second time and forget it. And those of you who have never taken it, when you come at me telling me you want to take the exam, that's why I'm crazy on you. That's why I'm telling you all the things I did. And despite all the things I did, there are things that I didn't do, obviously. Like get hooked up to a trainer, a coach who has been in the trenches for going to over a decade. That's why I tell you, come to my training because I don't trust other people with you. I cannot trust other people with you. Because I don't know if they will go as far as I would go with you. Like, you come on the journey with me, 
you know, I ain't going to spare you. I'm going to make sure you do everything you need to do for your own good. I don't want you to go through what I did. I want to make the exam look even crazier than it did for me so that when you go in there, you're loaded, you're armed to the teeth. One of my students from the FBI said, Phil, of course, you know, that topic, that topic, that topic, you armed us to the teeth. We went in there. It was easy. All of my students from my FBI class, a hundred percent pass from that class and many other classes because I tell it like it is. I let them know what I faced. I want them to face that. So if you are getting ready for the exam, my friends, there are a few more things I want to share with you. A few more things. But for now, do you have any questions, comments, or concerns? Because right now, we've got an open chat for you to ask questions right this second. If you look on YouTube to the right-hand side, you see an open chat. Do you have questions? That's why I come on here. I don't come on here to waste time. I don't come on here to while away the time. I come on here to help those getting ready so they don't go through that mad experience I did. And one of the things I did before hitting that end button, I, I said my last prayer, if I come out of this exam, alive. If I do, I'm making a promise I will help every single person in the world that cares to hear the sound of my voice. I feel sorry for some of my friends because I have told them about the PMP exam against their will. They're like, Phil, no, no, not for me. I don't want to hear. I'm like, wait, wait, I need to tell you. Just in case you find yourself in, in a dim lit room taking an exam with 200 questions, hey, they're like, Phil, no. No, no, I will not find myself taking any such exam. Thank you. But that's why I come on here. So if you have any questions, now will be a good time to ask before I go to the next section. All right. The next section, I just want to point out some tips for you about how to answer questions. And I wish I knew this. I wish I knew this myself. Unfortunately, I did not. I did not know it. So let me go through some of these with you. Think about it. How do you deal with long-winded questions? You deal with long-winded questions by marking them on your first experience with them. Taking a best guess and moving on. So this is my this is this is how I do it. I look at the question if it is beyond two lines long, it immediately falls into my bucket of PMI bottomless pit questions. I mark them. I may or may not be inclined to take a best guess, depending on how my time is running out. If I find my time is going so, so quickly, I take a best guess. I don't care. I go with it. I train myself to maximize the time I've got. So if I've got one hour left and I've got 70 questions, you know that I'm going to be mowing them down by taking a best guess and moving on quick, but I'll mark them to come back. Those of you who are like me, you, you don't have any specific medical condition, but you read so slow and then you read it the second time. That's what I do. And that's why I when I get into the exam, my strategy is long-winded, anything more than two lines long, going into three lines, you're going to fall into my PMI bottomless pick questions. On a good day, I may, I may say more than three lines, but it's typically two lines, over two lines. I mark it. I take a best guess whether I've read it or not and move on. Someone says, Phil, that's a bit reckless. Well, that's my style. That's the way I do stuff. That's the way I take my exams. I take the exam like that because I'm such a slow reader that if I do not do it that way, I'm going to end up spending seven hours for a four hour exam. So long winded questions, they get marked, they get guessed and they get shelved until I can come back. It's my strategy. It works for me. For you, it might be very different. Okay. So, Questions more than two lines long, you're going to fall into PMI's bottomless pit category. Thanks, but no thanks. At least not now. I move on. 
When I take an exam, I make sure psychologically speaking, mentally, I am in total control of my exam. Total control. I do not let the exam control me. Some people let the exam control them. They're fearful. They're fretful. No. No PMI. I'm the boss. No question writer. You don't intimidate me. You got to practice the art of intimidating the exam yourself. Don't let the exam intimidate you. It was written by your peers. You're smart. You got it down. You got it together. You've done your homework. No. It's a mind game primarily, my friends. If going into the exam, you're shaking and shivering and you're not able to do things at will, the exam might just throw you all over the place. Trust me. I've taken six PMI exams because I know some folks will be like, Phil, who are you to tell us all this? I've taken the PMP, the PMI RMP, the PMI SP, the CAPM, the OPM3, the father of all, which PMI does not do anymore. But I had three exams in one certification because they're different levels. And my friends who are OPM3s, they know you've got the entry one, you've got the midpoint one to qualify, to get in, and then you've got the final one. And we're talking about not just PMI knowledge, we're talking about software that PMI had at the time. Crazy exam. Crazy. Plus the ACP. Six PMI exams. So when I tell you a strategy, listen up. Because you might just very well be like Phil, who reads as slow as a snail on some days. So I rely a lot on my intuition. If I come across a question and it's more than two lines long, you'll fall into PMI's bombless pick category. I'm marking you. I'm moving on. Thank you very much. Now, coming across vague questions, questions that are just all over the place. Again, thank you, PMI. You're not going to scramble my mental thinking right now. You're going to be marked. You're going to be guessed. And I'm moving on to the land of milk and honey down the road. Where's the land of milk and honey down the road? Your gimmies. I cannot believe how many students are oblivious to this important tip. Going into the PMP exam, it's a race to find your gimmies. One. Two, it's a race to jump over the obstacles. Long-winded questions are obstacles. Vague questions are obstacles. How do they make these questions obstacles to the point that they can kill your exam? Let me tell you from experience. By the time I got to question 20 in the experience I just narrated for you, I felt like I had already finished the exam because my energy was depleted. Question 20 made me feel like I had run a four-hour exam already. Do you see why I'm so passionate about avoiding the obstacles? Because I was being led like a, a sheep to slaughter. Seriously, those first 20 questions, it's as though they were architected, they were engineered in so that there would be an obstacle to me finding my gimmies. Because honestly, if the entire exam was like those first 20 questions I saw, there is no way the average PM would be able to pass that exam. Those first 20 questions were evil. They were demented. <laughs> and look, this is not just me. I had a student from Info back in 2009, <laughs> Steve, Steve, if you're listening, you remember what you told me. He was the first student to get certified from my info class of 2009. He said, Phil, I don't know what those people are on, but they sure are on something. Those, those question writers who wrote the questions, they're definitely on something. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I'd never laugh so hard because for the first time, there was someone who knew what I was talking about. There was someone who had experienced what I was talking about. 
I said, exactly, Steve. Welcome to the world of the PMP exam. I'm glad you went through this experience because now you can tell your colleagues that this Phil is not just a maniac. He wasn't, he wasn't lying. He was telling the truth, <laughs> you know? So, my friends, when you come across the long-winded questions, the vague questions, you need to be saying, thank you very much, PMI. I ain't biting. I ain't taking it. I ain't going to snack on this. I ain't going to chew on this. I'm going to the land down the road where I'm going to find my gimmies. Thank you very much. Next. That's what you need to do. Now, another strategy I employ when I take the exam is one of commanding the exam to move where I want it to move. How do I do that? When I come across the exam, I first of all, in my mind, talk to the exam and let it know I don't need to take what you're offering me. I don't need to take question two after question one. I can choose to advance to the master slide where they show you all the 200 and I could choose to go into question 50. In fact, I remember for my ACP exam, which I did many, many years after my PMP, but for my ACP, I started off with question one, two, three. I kind of got bored, so I went down the road to question 50, went down the road to question 125, kind of just scouting out the area. And I'm nodding, I'm like, okay, yeah, I see. Okay, let's go to question 175. What do you got there? Oh yeah, okay. Question 200, what you got? That's how you need to boss the exam around. Don't let the exam jerk you around by saying, you've done one, now move to two, then move to three. No, what if I choose not to? It helps me feel in control. Seriously, it does. Another thing that helps me feel in control is taking breaks. Who are you to tell me I cannot take a break? I rehearse the breaks. I'm going to take a break. I'm taking a break at question 50, taking a, it makes me feel good. It's a mind thing. Look, I've heard this from so many students. Phil, this thing starts in the mind. I'm like, of course. Didn't you hear me say that? Of course it starts in the mind. So dealing with long-winded questions and dealing with vague questions, your first encounter with them is going to be, no, no, you don't. Okay? Your second strategy, after you found your gimmies, did you get that? Three types of questions on the PMP exam. One, those that are long-winded. Two, those that are vague. Three, those that you know. That's it. The long-winded ones, you don't know if you really know them or not. Sometimes I don't even want to find out just yet because finding out that I know the question could eat two minutes of my time. I would rather use those two minutes to find five gimmies. Think about the dynamic when you take the PMP exam. Think about it for a second. Have you encountered questions that you mow them down like this, like this, like like you just know them inside out? You're like, that's A, that's B, that's C, that's D. And I mean, two minutes has gone by and you've already just taken out five questions. Has that ever happened to you? It's happened to me. I've come across questions that I'm like, I might as well have been the author of this question. Have you ever come across questions where you question the question because it's so easy for you, those are your gimmies. Those are your gimmies right there. Okay? So dealing with long-winded questions, skip. Dealing with vague questions, skip. Dealing with gimmies, take them, um, take no prisoner. You want to find your gimmies. Let me tell you what the PMP exam is. It's a race to find your gimmies. The PMP exam is a race to find your gimmies and answer them well. And then you go back to the long-winded ones. Are you getting me? When you go back to the long-winded questions, you've got a boatload of time to play with. You first need to scout out the exam and find your gimmies. And then what you've got left, let's say you've got 50 long-winded questions and 25 vague questions remaining. You found 125 of your gimmies. Life is looking good. 
Am I making sense? Why am I so passionate about you finding your gimmies first? Let me tell you why. You come into the PMP exam, you are as fresh as can be. You're feeling on top of the world. You got your ammo, you're all beefed up, you're all jacked up, you're ready to go. You come across the first long-winded question. The second one. Sprinkle in five vague questions. What happens? Energy's going. Energy's going. You come across a gimme. A gimme that should have taken you 10 seconds, took you 30 seconds. You keep on trudging along. They slam you with another crazy, vague, long-winded, all-at-once question. You try and take that one out. You're thinking about the ridiculous PV formula. You're mixing it up now with FV. You don't even know whether you're in net present value or whether you're in decision trees. You're getting confused now. You see what they're trying to do. They send you these scud missiles ahead of time to slow you down so that by the time you get to your gimmies, you are already feeling drained. This is how questions are posed and positioned on any exam where the stakes are high. At least, if they're schooled in this thought, testing you from a real-world perspective, trust me, the questions are not just randomly dished out. Oh, let's just randomly dish out question one as question one. No. The way the questions are structured, pockets of difficulty, is for a reason. By the time I took my exam in reverse from question 200, I got to question 120, a pocket of difficult questions. I got to question 75, a pocket of difficult questions. They come in waves, my friend. Waves. And if you are not attentive to these things, you'll miss out on taking the exam intelligently. You see? So, what I would like you to do is, as you encounter these questions that are vague and difficult, bear in mind you're coming back to them, and when you do, spend a little bit more time. But again, not excessive, because if you've got 50 vague questions or 50 difficult questions, long-winded, you still need a significant amount of time to go through those. And that's why I say, take a best guess. When you're coming back to it, at least you've got a best guess down, there's a one in four chance of you getting it right. And that's good. And don't spend more than a minute. Like if you've got 50 left and you've got one hour left, you cannot afford to spend more than a minute on many of these long-winded, vague questions. You know, that's how I tackle my exam. It's, it's up to you, but these are strategies to keep in mind. I'm not saying everyone should take the exam like this. No. Some exams, I've taken them from start to end, almost all the way through without jumping around. But the PMP definitely had to jump around because my gimmies were scattered all over, all over. And I hear this from many people, even my students that get the five ATs. They say, Phil, when I was taking the exam, I didn't know if I was going to pass. Can you imagine? Five ATs. Now, some people say, but Phil, what was the, what was the result when you took the exam? Did you, did you pass on your first try? Yeah, I did. I passed on my first try, but not just that. I got far above the passing score out of six areas. At the time, there were six areas. Out of those six areas, I got above the passing score in all six. But the five that I got the highest in were in the 80s, the 90s. I remember professional responsibility. I got a 90-something in that one. Professional responsibility and all the other areas except one, they were all far above the passing score. So it just goes to show you that when you're going through the exam and it looks like hell, don't lose hope because you could very well be doing awesome. You don't know. All right. The third point here is the project manager is a problem solver. Be aware of that. When you get a question, you got to solve the real problem. Okay? You know, for example, you're a project manager on a project. A team member brings you um, a problem that has been faced on the project. What should you do? If the answer that you choose is not solving the problem to some degree, it may not be the right answer. 
So you, you need to remember, oh, I should be solving problems. I shouldn't, I shouldn't be saying, go back and solve it yourself. That is not a problem solver. You've just created more of a problem because when they come back to you, you may have other problems that make this problem a bigger problem. You're a problem solver. Think about that. Read the entire answer sentence as something could make it wrong. I've said this uh, previously on, on this um, study, right? Read the entire thing. Read the entire question. Read all the answers. Answer the question as though you're in a strong matrix or projectized firm. So remember, you got the power. Be sure to answer all, A-L-L, -L, all means all, all questions. Remember that pacing yourself is also very important. Lastly, take the breaks. Remember I said this? Take the breaks. Take the breaks. You need to answer all the questions because there's a one in four chance you'll get it right. You need to pace yourself. It's important to pace yourself. You need to take breaks if you need them. Okay. Next, I'm going to show you an example of some of these questions that are troublesome and how they are structured. Some of you students of ours have already seen these. You've already seen these. So you're probably going to get them right <laughs> because you saw them a few days ago. But anyway, here is one of them. You've just been assigned to the PLC LLC project. Everything appears to be going well. You just reported on status to your boss when suddenly you discover a big problem that needs to be resolved. What should you do immediately? Now, I know, I know lots of you have seen this question before, so don't, don't pretend that you haven't. I know you have. But for those that haven't, <laughs> I'm going to give them a few minutes to answer the question if they so wish. So I'm going to give you two minutes, customary time, to answer this question. And you can chat in, chat in here, please. If you would, civil play, type in the answer. Two minutes, I will review whatever you type in, if you type in. If I don't get any chats, I'll just um, conclude that there's no one on the call. And um, I will hurriedly tell you the answer and move on. But two minutes. Let's see. If there are any takers, two minutes, two minutes, two minutes, two minutes.
All right. Well, let's take a look at this question. I'll go over this really quick. I don't think we got any chats in and I, oh, we did get one chat. Um, Avinash, thank you very much for chatting this in Avinash. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I'm glad that you uh, participated. Thank you very much. It says you have just been assigned to the PLC LLC project. Everything appears to be going well. You just reported on status to your boss when suddenly you discover a big problem that needs to be resolved. What should you do immediately? Avinash, because you got the question right, I am not going to go into the long thesis of why your answer is correct, but you are correct. Now, let me show you a few landmines to be aware of on a question like this. Those of you who um, may be watching after the fact, but I want to I want to address um, this, even though Avinash got it right. So it says um, big problem that needs to be resolved. What should you do? The key word is immediately. So big problem and immediately. Okay. The first option is wrong because it says call a meeting of all stakeholders immediately. Seriously, can you do that immediately? And then it says recommend schedule compression approaches. Well, in all honesty, you don't know what the problem is. You cannot at attach it to schedule. So A is wrong. B says, speak to your customer immediately. That's wrong. We're not going to speak to our customer immediately. And it says, share bad news. Well, problems are not bad news. That is a way of life for PM solving problems. So B is wrong. And D says, call your boss and let him know. Again, bad news. Do you see what I said about PM candy? The sprinkling in the words bad news, sprinkling in the words meetings, things that we gravitate towards in the real world. It says, he should not leave the office with this incorrect information. How do we know he is in the office? So D is, is wrong. So that's just ridiculous. All right, Avinash, here's another question for you. So this one says, your project team appears to have been demotivated by a recent company announcement regarding project A42. You realize you need to motivate them. Which of the following will best act as a motivator for your team? So I'll give you a couple of minutes and uh, let you think about the answer. So. Two minutes, customary.
All right. Well, let's see what we have. If we have any chats, any responses. I don't think we got any response for this one. Okay. Well, I'm not going to let the cat out of the bag. I am going to hop on down to Tip Alley, where I give you guys a few tips on how to continue answering some of these questions. So I'm going to give you the final two. And this is Emily's four point tips for the PMP exam. Emily's my co trainer, and she has some tips for taking the PMP exam and decision making. So, one, look at the impact. Look at the impact that the problem is having in the question. Two, evaluate alternatives. Look at all the alternatives for solving the problem. And then, if that doesn't work, the next best option will be discuss with the sponsor and get sponsor approval. And then the last one would be get customer approval. You see sponsor comes before the customer. So if you get these questions, usually you will have the options. Option one could be um, analyze what has happened. You know, like it says, there's a big problem. What should you do first? That first one we looked at, there's a big problem. What should you do first? The first one is usually <clears throat> the best, right? Analyze the problem. That's what you should do first. Analyze the problem. That's what you should do immediately. Before going to cry to the customer, <laughs> you you might want to look at the problem first, project manager. That's how the PMI thinks. You're a project manager in a strong matrix. So you don't just go to the boss or the customer for every little thing. You look for solutions first, right? So you look at the impact, you look, you analyze it, you research, then you look for alternatives. That's the second best thing. And then the third one, discuss with the sponsor or whoever that authority is. It could be someone else, but discuss with the sponsor, get sponsor approval. And then last but not least, get customer approval so if you had these options and let's say option one wasn't there then the next best thing to do will be to evaluate alternatives if that wasn't there the next best thing to do will be to discuss with the sponsor and get approval if that's not there then customer approval that's how you need to think this stuff through all right last slide Emily's five point tips for PMP exam formula questions. One, write the formula on your crib sheet at the beginning. Well, that's changed a little bit in that. From what I'm hearing about Pearson, they don't give you paper anymore. I, I'm, I'm yet to establish if that is completely true. But a lot of students say they get a whiteboard. So if you get a whiteboard, you ain't going to be able to do this on a crib sheet. But you can do it on your whiteboard. You might need to practice writing really small on that whiteboard just so you don't have to, to clean it off. Before doing anything, ensure it is truly a calculation question. So in the example I gave you about what is the slack, what is the project slack, uh, or, or what is the slack on the critical path? Yeah, that one. You gotta remember the critical path has zero float or slack. So no need to calculate. So you need to make sure, oh, is it really a calculation question? So you don't waste your time, you know. Um, three, actually work out the solution because a lot of times you think you're doing mental math, but you're getting it wrong because remember what I told you about the obstacles they're planting in front of you, the obstacles they plant in front of you, my friend, sometimes they just make you select some crazy option or get a ridiculous answer that isn't so out of what the answers could be. So my advice to you would be to actually work them out with a calculator do as, as little mental math as possible because the exam, the way it makes you think, it just makes you think differently sometimes. Oh, Avinash. Oh, I saw that you answered the question. Okay. Well, we might have to go back to that and you can check out the answer later. But thank you for participating. Um, I didn't answer it because I thought there was no one at home. <laughs> I thought there was no one there anymore. All right. Um, four, take the numbers and plug them in. So do it in a methodical manner and uh, five, check your work. All right. So I hope that helps you. 
Avinash, thank you for jumping on and playing the game with us. Let me go back to that question and answer it so that you have an idea. Uh, yes, so Avinash, the, the option you chose for this question, that is indeed... Uh, no, I'm sorry. That is not the answer. All right, so let me address why that is not the answer. Let's read it bit by bit. Your project team appears to have been demotivated. That's the problem, okay? By a recent company announcement regarding Project A42. So we don't know what the announcement is exactly, but we know it's regarding the project somehow. You realize you need to, you need to motivate them, meaning the team. Okay, I need to motivate someone. I need to motivate the team. Which of the following will best act as a motivator for your team? A motivator. So what the question is asking, you remember my tip about keeping your eye on the ball? The ball right here is you need to motivate them. They are demotivated, you need to motivate them. What will best act as a motivator that you could use? Now, while it's not spelling out that you could use, you need to follow the line of thought here. All right? The line of thought is it's all about you. You are the person that is going to need to motivate them. So how are you going to do that? That is really what this question is getting at. How are you going to motivate them? So how will you? And there are some options here. Let's take a look at these options. Option A. Ensuring challenging work. Hmm. This sounds a little bit like something from Abraham Maslow. Challenging work. That could motivate people. It could. It could. Mm -hmm. Could motivate. Challenging work could motivate some people. But that's not the only thing here, though. Right? That's not the only thing. Let's see what else they've got written here. Apart from challenging work, it goes further to say while on A42 and hygiene factors. Wait a minute. That sounds like Herzberg's theory of hygiene factors. Herzberg's two-factor theory. What did Herzberg say? This is where you need to put on a bigger PMP thinking cap and say, hmm, is that really what Herzberg told me? <laughs> I, don't, I don't recall Herzberg telling me that uh, hygiene factors were the motivator. What did Herzberg tell you? Does anybody know? Can you chat into me what Herzberg told you? Oh, so that's how you want to play the game. You don't want to chat in. That's not how we play the game on this channel, my friends. You got to chat in. Otherwise, it's a monologue. I need you to chat in. You don't chat in. I ain't going to chat. Anybody know Herzberg's theory? Or not? Crickets. Chirp, 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 chirp. <laughs> Nobody wants to bell the cat. All right. I know you're at work. I'm not going to jerk your chain, rattle your chain. I'll give you the answer. <sighs> hygiene factors don't motivate, my friends. They don't. Absence of hygiene factors could demotivate. But hygiene factors in and of themselves do not motivate. Please remember that. Okay? Hygiene factors do not motivate. Lack of them demotivates. 
So what is being said here, ensuring challenging work, that would have been plausible. But when it says and hygiene factors, this just renders option A incorrect. Okay. All right. Option B. Maslow's theory. Talking about challenging work. Maslow's theory. And let me just cancel it. So if you're on the exam, mentally cancel wrong options. Just mentally strike them out. Okay. Option B. Maslow's theory and individual professional responsibility. First of all, you cannot motivate people with Maslow's theory. That doesn't even make sense. So the way option B is structured right off the bat, it's bogus. Remember what I told you about PM candy? This is an example of PM candy. Yes, being aware of how Maslow's theory pans into people being motivated is good for the project manager to know, but it is not a motivator. So B is incorrect. All right. It also says individual project, individual professional responsibility. No, you cannot motivate people with their individual professional responsibility. It's theirs. They can be motivated by using it like, with themselves intrinsically. So B is describing something intrinsic. You cannot use that. Cannot be a motivator. So that's wrong. Uh, D, expectancy theory, Victor Vroom. But expectancy theory is not a motivator, right? Even if you wanted to spin it that way, this is also an intrinsic thing. You see in option D, it says expectancy theory and intrinsic motivation. What does expectancy theory tell you? The summary is people put in more effort put in all the efforts they do, they remain productive because they expect a reward at the end. But then, the theory in and of itself is not the motivator. You've got to be careful with how they word these things. And then again, intrinsic motivation is not something you can use. So A is wrong, B is wrong, D is wrong, and C is the right answer. Okay? And with that, my friends, you've been listening to the wrap-up of PMP Exam Prep Camp. I invited you along for the ride. We had students who were on this journey for five weeks, and our final class was on Saturday, Saturday that just ended August 17th. Those of you that want to be in such a class, feel free to let us know by sending us a message to support at praiseon.com. That's right, support at praiseon.com. And as soon as you can, sign up because we'll be getting back to you with when our next one is. They're usually every Saturday. Now, before we have that one, for our more advanced students, we'll be having a tech camp, PMP exam tech camp. Again, if you want to be part of the tech camp, it's not as long as the full-on boot camp. And we focus more on the technicalities like schedule, cost, risk, quality. The technicality surrounding any knowledge area. That's pretty much what we focus on. All right. Well, it looks like it's that time. I have to jump off again. But before I jump off, do you have questions I can answer for you? Because you know I would love to do that. Questions, comments, concerns of any sort. Go in once, go in twice, go in thrice. I'm not seeing any comments or chats, which means it might be time for us to talk about trickery on the exam again. So I think that's what we're going to be doing, my friends. We're probably going to have to shift gears and go into the exam trickery. That is probably what we should do. Let's talk about the exam trickery. You know your friend Phil is always at the ready to talk about these things. How the exam is a really tricky one. Derailed. 
and you're going to get the question wrong. And, and this is one of the reasons why certain questions are not home runs for people. Okay, so talking about passing the exam, you really need to strategically and intentionally look at the, the moving parts. You, you know, you see a question written as one block, then it shifts to another. You need to feel that shift. You need to know, oh, wait a minute, that question, it shifted. It, they've moved from what I'm doing to something else. What are they really looking for in the final you know, the big hurrah at the end. What are they really looking for? When they give you that final line, you can either make or break your experience by following this tip. Don't get lost. Hold on to that first thing. And as you're navigating the question, always remember, you're doing this. You're doing X. You're doing Y. You're doing Z. Still along some rather elementary lines, but nonetheless, something that could help you. You could get questions such as, you are creating or developing a document A document X. This document will be used to Y. The document can also be used for whatever. You could get a what should you do next based on knowing which document you're working on or you could get which tool and technique will you use to create X. Something like that. There are many, many ways, you know, if I was a question writer, I could cause a whole lot of havoc just by messing around with these four blocks one block of what is going on, a second block of what could result from what is going on, and I could even be more malicious as a question writer, and I could totally throw you off. I could give you th streams of thought, streams of possibilities that could derail you by giving you candy, PM candy, things that excite you but are just totally irrelevant. Totally irrelevant. Let me give you another example. Another example. Okay. Let's look at a scenario whereby you get a question. Here is a network diagram. Okay. There are twelve nodes. One of the nodes, or I should say, one of the branches is hanging. What do I mean by that? Well, if you haven't seen one of those network diagrams with a hanging branch that isn't really joining to the others, it's going off on its own. So there are 12 nodes, one of the branches is hanging. Here 
here are all the activity durations. The customer would like the deliverable on the day you end. Okay? And then it could build on that to say, what is the project slack? If I gave you a big old network diagram with all these fancy arrows and images, that's enough to excite anyone that has studied that. So imagine if I gave you a big old network diagram to go with this. A lot of folks would rub their hands in glee, like I used to in those days. Oh, I've read this. I know this. And start, just go out of the gate and begin to solve that network diagram like a bat being let out of I don't know where. However, if you read the question carefully, you realize that there's no need for you to solve a single thing. If the customer would like the deliverable on the day you end, then you've got no slack. You've got zero slack. There is absolutely no need for you to start solving anything here. This is an example of where you would do so much work, 10 minutes worth of work, only to realize that there was no point. Another example of such could be, here's a network diagram. There are 12 nodes. One of the branches is hanging. Here are the durations. And then, what is the free slack of task A. Task A is the first task. Now, if you get a question like this, again, you could get excited and begin solving till the cows come home. But task A, if it's a, a network diagram where there is, you know, one beginning task, task A, the free slack will be zero. You don't need to solve nothing. It's going to be zero. The same as a task at the end of the chain. It will be zero. So getting all excited and solving this network diagram is only going to waste your time. You, you will get the answer right, but you would have wasted 10 minutes on a network diagram that is asking you, what is the free slack of an activity that's on the critical path? Or what is the total slack of an activity on the critical path? Do you see what I'm saying? I'm trying to get you to see these questions for what they are. A lot of these questions, a lot of these questions, they don't need as much effort as people put in. People put in a lot of effort, but unfortunately, they didn't need to. They didn't need to do what they're doing. OK, so I hope this is helping you. I hope this is, you know, kind of turning on the light bulbs bit by bit for you to see that the reasons why certain folks may not do well in a question is not because they haven't studied. It's not because they didn't read. But more than anything else is because they are not paying attention to what the question is asking. They might just be in the dark. They may be oblivious. You see, so these are just a few examples of how questions are engineered and how people could totally miss the boat when it comes to answering these questions. So let's uh, have a little recap. First of all, I gave you the breakdown of X. You're doing X in order to achieve Y. That just showed you red herrings could be deliberately placed in questions. It's testing your loyalty, like Dre said. 
you know. Secondly, you could be given a, oh, you're creating this document or you're creating this plan. You know, which tool and technique would you use to create this plan or that thing? And you'll be given a tool and technique that maps back to the process where that thing is created or where that thing is done. And then I'm giving you some more problem-oriented, formula-oriented type question. It looks formula-oriented on the surface or technical on the surface, but it's really logic, you know. So you've got to get your logic game up. When it comes to network diagrams, you've got to know the definitions inside out to know when logic is needed to solve the problem versus a calculator. A calculator. So don't make the mistake of wasting time on questions where the answer is staring at you in the face. On the critical path, you got zero zero slack zero float in all of the activities free float total float if the end date of the project is the same as customer required due date as in the previous one zero project float so you got to know the theory behind whatever you're doing okay don't just read blindly but know the theory okay and practice questions that are tested and tried you know I tell people don't just jump on these ridiculously cheap free mock exams on the internet no I didn't say companies I'm talking about people that just go to the internet and do a search what is wrong with you are you kidding me you you're playing with your $555 by searching for these crummy questions on the internet and you're jubilating that you found a treasure trove of rubbish on the internet seriously don't do it if you haven't heard it before there's a lot of poison out there I'm amazed watch this a student jubilated about finding four mock exams on the web I got a little bit concerned. I'm like, there's no reason for you to do this. <laughs> you know, have you have you ever had a kid that's still looking for more? Even though you gave them everything they needed, they're still looking for more. That's how I felt. Because I'm like, my goodness, you've not even you've not even done the mock exams we gave you. Why are you scouring the internet for free questions? Why? Do you want to harm yourself? Don't you know there's poison in that stuff? True story. I end up getting these mock exams. And I go through the mock exams and I'm like, oh my gosh. <laughs> I hold my head in disbelief. The very first one that I come across gives me some outlandish process name from prehistoric times. From the Pembok Guide that even the PMI forgot. I, I probably have the PMBOK, yeah, I probably have that edition somewhere in my bookshelf, but the PMI forgot about it because it's asking for something from 10 years ago. I'm like, oh my gosh, where did you get this poison from? I couldn't believe it. I went to the second one and there in big bold letters at the top, was this is based on the Pembok fourth edition what we are, we are on the sixth edition you're you're taking stuff into your system from a previous edition I almost lost it I almost lost it I composed an email really quick and you know save yourself <laughs> get get off this train this train is leading this is the train to nowhere what look this is one of the reasons people fail because they took a mock exam that told them oh you're ready meanwhile the mock exam was just absolute rubbish not based on the current guide not even written properly it, it amazes me how how people just put their money at risk hard-earned money at risk you know don't do it 
don't do it. So please take mock exams that are tested and tried and have a track record. Mock exams where if you are stuck on a question, you can ask a human that will actually respond to you. Because a lot of people are taking these goofy old mocks that are worse than poison. Fourth edition, are you kidding me? Some people even take mocks based on the second edition. You know, it's funny, I heard from a question writer on social media that was saying, it's amazing, this stuff, I created this stuff like over, I don't even remember when, like eons ago. People are still using what I created, even though it's wrong. But there's nothing I can do. People just keep passing it around. Oh, take this link. Watch this. Do this. Honestly, this is your friend Phil keeping it real for you. There's no other channel where it gets as raw as this. Because people don't want to tell it like it is. I don't care. I'll tell you. I want to save you. Don't do it. Please don't do it. People say, my funds are low. Yes, okay, funds are low, but that's no reason to get crazy, bad crazy, start doing dumb things that are going to land you in more trouble, make you pay $325 more to the PMI. Don't do it. Please, don't do it. Don't do it. I would rather you took no mock exam than taking contaminated mocks. Enough said. A word is enough for the wise. I'm going to get off my soapbox. Let me see if there are any questions come in or any comments. Any confusion that you need straightening out on. Any questions? Any questions? Go in once. You know if there are no questions, I just put you back in smack dab in line with your friend Phil. He'll, he'll just keep talking. We'll get an, another version of Phil. Phil 1.0 or 2.0. We'll, we'll find one. Any questions before we jump off for tonight? Going once. Going twice. Going three times. Well, thank you all very much. The purpose I put this together really was to help people who have not been doing well on the test multiple times. It's always sad to hear when someone put in money, time, attention, put the family on hold. It's, it's very sad, you know, and a lot of people who feel their careers are in the balance. You know, like one student who told me management is demanding, management wants blood. It's just sad. Another student said, Phil, my, my management said I haven't passed the exam. They want their money back for the course, the course that I took. It's sad. And that is what drives me to help people pass the exam. That is why I'm always giving tips and tricks and the like. Okay? Well, the videos will keep playing. Don't worry. If you've got questions much later on, you can drop them in. As soon as I'm able, I will respond to you, get you an answer. But for now, I'll leave you in the capable hands of your buddy, Phil. Failing the PMP exam is something you don't want to experience. Lots of money and moreover, a lot of time that you cannot ever regain go down the drain. Once upon a time, there was a student who didn't do too well on the exam. And I was wondering, what can we do to get this student in a better state. So jointly, we came up with this idea of an Excel file that will help track progress, that will help track what happened on the exam and how you can do better. I put together a page called the PMP exam failure stamp out page, purposely for people who have failed the PMP exam to help them in their efforts. Speaker, author, and coach to thousands of professionals and organizations worldwide, including NASA, the U.S. Air Force, USACE, U.S. Army, the Department of Transportation, the FBI. Your friend, Phil. Over to you, Phil. 
Hey, my fellow project managers, I hope you're doing awesome. You've heard it, you've heard it all. I'm telling you, you can pass this exam. But I wanted to add further value to you by just giving you a few ideas about how exam questions can trip you up. And if you have been trying to get certified over and over again without success, I want you to begin to look at questions in a different light, okay? So this is to give you a more pragmatic way of addressing the problem. Yes, I've given you that page, the stamp out page. Yes, I've given you tips about pages in the PMBOK guide. But I want to focus a little bit on how questions can trip you up. So a few days ago, I was playing with a few questions, kind of kicking them around back and forth between our students. And I realized that they were getting tripped up by a certain question characteristic. They're getting tripped up on questions that have multiple dimensions. So I want to address this multiple dimension question writing approach that people might be struggling with. Maybe you've come across such a thing as well. This might help you, okay? So the questions are usually you are a project manager doing X, Y, Z. Let me just go to the whiteboard, chart this out a little bit, and you'll get the idea of what I'm trying to say. All right. So it usually starts off like this. You are a project manager. And they usually tell you what you're doing. You are doing that, whatever it is. Okay, we'll just say you're doing, just put X variable. Okay. Now, where I see people beginning to get distracted is when the question shifts into the reasoning behind what you're doing. And I'll explain this in a, in a few seconds. So think about it. You're a project manager, you're doing X. And then the question could follow up in order to achieve Y. You're a project manager, you're doing X, whatever that variable is, in order to achieve Y, where you will derive A variable Z. And then a red herring. A red herring is added to the mix. What do I mean? A distractor. So, sum it to the effect of while you are. doing X, you realize a problem which could affect outcome Z. Are you following the line of thought? Okay, so this is a question with various aspects and variables. If you don't keep your eye on this first one, I'm going to make these different colors. Let's make this blue. Let's make this a darker red or brownish. And this, I'll make this green. 
All right. If you don't keep your eye on the blue, you will get the question wrong. Whatever the question ends up being, if you don't keep your eye on the blue, what you are doing, you end up getting the question wrong. The question usually ends with a big finish such as, It's usually something to the effect of what should you do next? Are you looking at these variables? Are you seeing how these variables are being set up? You're a project manager, you're doing X. That's, that's the first piece of the question. All right. Now they're beginning to derail you, or let's say beginning to test your focus and your understanding, as one of my students, former student, now PMP boss, would say, Dre, he would say, they want to find out if you're loyal. <laughs> they, want, they want to find out, are you still loyal to the PMBOK guide? In other words, are you really paying attention to what you are doing as a project manager? And are you really aware of what you should be focusing on as a project manager? You see? So by the time you get to point two, you're beginning to get a little bit of a pull, a gravitational pull away from one. This is why questions sometimes appear very ambiguous because they put in a number of variables but it's done in a subtle manner so your project manager doing X in order to achieve Y where you will derive Z so you're doing X because you want to achieve Y and from Y you're gonna derive Z whatever that is while you're doing X you realize a problem which could affect outcome Z what should you do next let me show you what this question has done. This question has taken your focus away from number one. What are you doing? What should you do next? Two and three, let's put in three. Three, distractor. It said a problem which could affect outcome Z, but still, that's not really focusing on I'm doing item one, what should I do next? Item two, what I'm trying to achieve, and all these other things, they could be red herrings on the question. Okay, I'm not saying every single question is like this, but I'm trying to show you how your focus could easily be taken away. Your focus could be taken away from what exactly you should be focusing on. And this is why certain folks may have trouble on the test because your attention is being taken away from the real thing you should be looking at. And I mean, someone could come away thinking, oh, but I answered the question based on three. I realized the problem. And what should I do next? Solve the problem. No. What should you do next? could be a number of could do next or should do next. You know, the question could be fine-tuned to say, which process should you do next? Or it could just be a what should you do next? But you don't want to lose sight of the first point. I realized that questions like this were throwing my students all over the place and they were getting distracted. You know, I think I had, on one question, I had zero correct answers. On some questions, I had like a 60% correct answer. You know, and this is what the PMI does, which is why when the questions are served, just know they've been passed around the block, they've been tested. So by the time the question is coming to you, 
almost guaranteed a certain number of people will always get that question wrong because they are focusing on the wrong thing. They're not answering the question, focusing on the first point. They got lost along the way. And this is just one, one scenario. There are many different scenarios I could paint, you know. But the overarching thing is, as you see these questions, do not forget what you are really doing in the very first stage. If you do, you're going to be derailed and you're going to get the question wrong. And, and this is one of the reasons why certain questions are not home runs for people. Okay, so talking about passing the exam, you really need to strategically and intentionally look at the, the moving parts. You, you know, you see a question written as one block, then it shifts to another. You need to feel that shift. You need to know, oh, wait a minute, that question, it shifted. It, they've moved from what I'm doing to something else. What are they really looking for in the final you know, the big hurrah at the end. What are they really looking for? When they give you that final line, you can either make or break your experience by following this tip. Don't get lost. Hold on to that first thing. And as you're navigating the question, always remember, you're doing this. You're doing X. You're doing Y. You're doing Z. Still along some rather elementary lines, but nonetheless, something that could help you. You could get questions such as, you are creating or developing a document A document X. This document will be used to Y. The document can also be used for whatever. You could get a what should you do next based on knowing which document you're working on or you could get which tool and technique will you use to create X. Something like that. There are many, many ways, you know, if I was a question writer, I could cause a whole lot of havoc just by messing around with these four blocks one block of what is going on, a second block of what could result from what is going on, and I could even be more malicious as a question writer, and I could totally throw you off. I could give you th streams of thought, streams of possibilities that could derail you by giving you candy PM candy, things that excite you but are just totally irrelevant. Totally irrelevant. Let me give you another example. Another example. Okay, let's look at a scenario whereby you get a question. Here is a network 
diagram. Okay. There are 12 nodes. One of the nodes, or I should say one of the branches, is hanging. What do I mean by that? Well, if you haven't seen one of those network diagrams with a hanging branch that isn't really joining to the others, it's going off on its own. So there are 12 nodes, one of the branches is hanging. Here are all the activity durations. The customer would like the deliverable on the day you end. Okay? And then it could build on that to say what is the project slack? If I gave you a big old network diagram with all these fancy arrows and images, that's enough to excite anyone that has studied that. So imagine if I gave you a big old network diagram to go with this. A lot of folks would rub their hands in glee, like I used to in those days. Oh, I've read this, I know this. And start just go out of the gate and begin to solve that network diagram like a bat being let out of I don't know where. However, if you read the question carefully, you realize that there's no need for you to solve a single thing. If the customer would like the deliverable on the day you end, then you've got no slack. You've got zero slack. There is absolutely no need for you to start solving anything here. This is an example of where you would do so much work, 10 minutes worth of work, only to realize that there was no point. Another example of such could be, here's a network diagram. There are 12 nodes. One of the branches is hanging. Here are the durations. And then, what is the free slack of task A? Task A is the first task. Now, if you get a question like this, again, you could get excited and begin solving till the cows come home, but Task A, if it's a, a network diagram where there is, you know, one beginning task, task A, the free slack will be zero. You don't need to solve nothing. It's going to be zero. The same as a task at the end of the chain. It will be zero. So getting all excited and solving this network diagram is only going to waste your time you, you will get the answer right, but you would have wasted 10 minutes on a network diagram that is asking you what is the free slack of an activity that's on the critical path, or what is the total slack of an activity on the critical path. Do you see what I'm saying? I'm trying to get you to see these questions for what they are. A lot of these questions, a lot of these questions, they don't need as much effort as people put in. People put in a lot of effort, but unfortunately, they didn't need to. They didn't need to do what they're doing. Okay? So I hope this is helping you. I hope this is, you know, kind of turning on the light bulbs bit by bit for you to see that the reasons why certain folks may not do well on a question is not because they haven't studied. 
It's not because they didn't read. But more than anything else, it's because they are not paying attention to what the question is asking. They might just be in the dark. They may be oblivious, you see. So these are just a few examples of how questions are engineered and how people could totally miss the boat when it comes to answering these questions. So let's uh, have a little recap. First of all, I gave you the breakdown of X. You're doing X in order to achieve Y. That just showed you red herrings could be deliberately placed in questions. It's testing your loyalty, like Dre said. You know. Secondly, you could be given a, oh, you're creating this document or you're creating this plan. You know, which tool and technique would you use to create this plan or that thing? And you'll be given a tool and technique that maps back to the process where that thing is created or where that thing is done. And then I'm giving you some more problem-oriented, formula-oriented type question. It looks formula-oriented on the surface or technical on the surface, but it's really logic, you know. So you got to get your logic game up. When it comes to network diagrams, you got to know the definitions inside out to know when logic is needed to solve the problem versus a calculator, a calculator. So don't make the mistake of wasting time on questions where the answer is staring at you in the face. On the critical path, you got zero, zero slack, zero float in all of the activities, free float, total float. If the end date of the project is the same as customer required due date as in the previous one, zero project float. So you got to know the theory behind whatever you're doing okay don't just read blindly but know the theory okay and practice questions that are tested and tried you know I tell people don't just jump on these ridiculously cheap free mock exams on the internet no I didn't say companies I'm talking about people that just go to the internet and do a search. What is wrong with you? Are you kidding me? You're, you're playing with your $555 by searching for these crummy questions on the internet. And you're jubilating that you found a treasure trove of rubbish on the internet. Seriously, don't do it. If you haven't heard it before, there's a lot of poison out there. I'm amazed, watch this, a student jubilated about finding four mock exams on the web. I got a little bit concerned, I'm like, there's no reason for you to do this, <laughs> you know. Have you, have you ever had a kid that's still looking for more, even though you gave them everything they needed, they're still looking for more? That's how I felt, because I'm like, my goodness, you've not, even, you've not even done the mock exams we gave you. Why are you scouring the internet for free questions? Why? Do you want to harm yourself? Don't you know there's poison in that stuff? True story. I end up getting these mock exams. And I go through the mock exams and I'm like, oh my gosh. <laughs> I hold my head in disbelief. The very first one that I come across gives me some outlandish process name from prehistoric times, from the PMBOK guide that even the PMI forgot. I, I probably have the PMBOK, yeah, I probably have that edition somewhere in my bookshelf, but the PMI forgot about it because it's asking for something from 10 years ago. I'm like, oh my gosh, where did you get this? poison from I couldn't believe it I went to the second one and there in big bold letters at the top was this is based on the Pembok 4th edition what we are, we are on the 6th edition you're you're taking stuff into your system from a previous edition 
I almost lost it. I almost lost it. I composed an email really quick and, you know, save yourself. <laughs> get, get off this train. This train is leading. This is a train to nowhere. What? Look, this is one of the reasons people fail because they took a mock exam that told them, oh, you're ready. Meanwhile, the mock exam was just absolute rubbish. Not based on the current guide, not even written properly. It, it amazes me how, how people just put their money at risk, hard earned money at risk. You know, don't do it. Don't do it. So please take mock exams that are tested and tried and have a track record. Mock exams where if you are stuck on a question, you can ask a human that will actually respond to you. Because a lot of people are taking these goofy old mocks that are worse than poison. Fourth edition? Are you kidding me? Some people even take mocks based on the second edition. You know, it's funny. I heard from a question writer on social media that was saying, it's amazing. This stuff, I created this stuff like over, I don't even remember when, like eons ago. People are still using what I created, even though it's wrong. But there's nothing I can do. People just keep passing it around. Oh, take this link. Watch this. Do this. Honestly, this is your friend Phil keeping it real for you. There's no other channel where it gets as raw as this. Because people don't want to tell it like it is. I don't care. I'll tell you. I want to save you. Don't do it. Please don't do it. People say my funds are low. Yes, okay, funds are low, but that's no reason to get crazy, bad crazy, start doing dumb things that are going to land you in more trouble, make you pay $325 more to the PMI. Don't do it. Please, don't do it. Don't do it. I would rather you took no mock exam than taking contaminated mocks. Enough said. A word is enough for the wise. I'm going to get off my soapbox. Let me see if there are any questions come in or any comments. Any confusion that you need straightening out on. Any questions? Any questions? Go in once. You know if there are no questions, I'll just put you back in smack dab in line with your friend Phil. He'll, he'll just keep talking. We'll get an, another version of Phil. Phil 1.0 or 2.0. We'll, we'll find one. Any questions before we jump off for tonight? Go in once. Go in twice. Go in three times. Well, thank you all very much. The purpose I put this together really was to help people who have not been doing well on the test multiple times. It's always sad to hear when someone put in money, time, attention, put the family on hold. It's, it's very sad, you know, and a lot of people who feel their careers are in the balance. You know, like one student who told me management is demanding, management wants blood. It's just sad. Another student said, Phil, my, my management said I haven't passed the exam. They want their money back for the course, the course that I took. It's sad. And that is what drives me to help people pass the exam. That is why I'm always giving tips and tricks and the like. Okay? Well, the videos will keep playing. Don't worry. If you've got questions much later on, you can drop them in. As soon as I'm able, I will respond to you, get you an answer. But for now, I'll leave you in the capable hands of your buddy, Phil. Failing the PMP exam is something you don't want to experience. Lots of money and moreover, a lot of time that you cannot ever regain go down the drain. Once upon a time, there was a student who didn't do too well on the exam. And I was wondering, what can we do to get this student in a better state. 
So jointly, we came up with this idea of an Excel file that will help track progress, that will help track what happened on the exam and how you can do better. I put together a page called the PMP exam failure stamp out page, purposely for people who have failed the PMP exam to help them in their efforts. Speaker, author, and coach to thousands of professionals and organizations worldwide, including NASA, the U.S. Air Force, USACE, U.S. Army, the Department of Transportation, the FBI, your friend, Phil. Over to you, Phil. Hey, my fellow project managers, I hope you're doing awesome. You've heard it, you've heard it all. I'm telling you, you can pass this exam. But I wanted to add further value to you by just giving you a few ideas about how exam questions can trip you up. And if you have been trying to get certified over and over again without success, I want you to begin to look at questions in a different light, okay? So this is to give you a more pragmatic way of addressing the problem. Yes, I've given you that page, the stamp out page. Yes, I've given you tips about pages in the PMBOK guide, but I wanna focus a little bit on how questions can trip you up. So a few days ago, I was playing with a few questions, kind of kicking them around back and forth between our students. And I realized that they were getting tripped up by a certain question characteristic. They're getting tripped up on questions that have multiple dimensions. So I want to address this multiple dimension question writing approach that people might be struggling with Maybe you've come across such a thing as well. This might help you, okay? So the questions are usually you are a project manager doing X, Y, Z. Let me just go to the whiteboard, chart this out a little bit, and you'll get the idea of what I'm trying to say. All right. So it usually starts off like this. You are a project manager. And they usually tell you what you're doing. You are doing that, whatever it is. OK, we'll just say you're doing, just put x variable. Okay. Now, where I see people beginning to get distracted is when the question shifts into the reasoning behind what you're doing. And I'll explain this in a, in a few seconds. So think about it. You're a project manager, you're doing X. And then the question could follow up in order to achieve Y. You're a project manager, you're doing X, whatever that variable is, in order to achieve Y, where you will derive a variable z. And then a red heron. A red heron is added to the mix. What do I mean? A distractor. So, something to the effect of, while you are doing X, you realize a problem which could affect outcome 
z. Are you following the line of thought? Okay, so the question with various aspects and variables, if you don't keep your eye on this first one, I'm going to make these different colors. Let's make this blue. So the summary is if you don't keep your eye on these things, these variables carefully, you might miss the punchline. You know, the punchline is really what should you do or what is required or something else. That's how these questions are set. The questions are set to give you a problem, but also a bunch of distractors. So let me cover some of those additional tips for you before we round up for today. So question writers will try to distract you as much as possible by offering many different ideas and PM candy. I call it PM candy buzzwords that excite you, but lead to nowhere. Beware of those. There are many questions crafted with an intent to lead you down a dark alley. Some questions will provide you with a line of thought that very quickly changes into something else, but that something else may or may not be required to answer the question. It's all about following the question all the way through from start to end. So my suggestion will be to read the entire question first before looking at the options. I have failed questions I wrote because of this bad habit. It's a very bad habit. I failed questions I wrote. So I wasn't in the same state of consciousness when I was answering. When I am in the know-it-all mode, I do foolish things. I look for options that I feel should be there instead of reading the full question. I have since learned my lesson, but bad habits die hard. And once in a while, I fall into that bad habit, trying to answer questions without going all the way through. And I just laugh. I'm like, yeah, I don't think I've totally gotten rid of that. It happens to even the best of us. So you've got to train yourself into reading the entire question. Use the PMI approach, the dig sieve. Now, this is not talked about very much. I guess I've probably coined the phrase for PMI. I guess they owe me for this one. You <laughs> use the PMI dig sieve approach C8.2 in the PMBOK guide. Seriously, they're talking about problem solving, but the honest truth is you can apply what the PMI are talking about in problem solving to solve problems on the PMP exam. I know it sounds weird and strange, but who would have thought you could use the PMBOK guide to answer PMP questions strategically? So the D is all about defining the problem. So as you come across a PMP exam question, you got to define the problem and then you got to identify what the root cause of the problem is. So that's what the I is. For those of you just joining, I'm talking about the Dixiv approach. Strongly believe in this method to solve problems. So let's hone in right here. You see D, define the problem. So if you're looking at a PMP exam question, ask yourself, what is the problem? Can you define it? If you cannot define what the problem is, then you've got a bigger problem. So you've got to break the question down to say, what is the problem? Okay, the problem is there is a problem that has not been broken down enough. In fact, the problem just says there's a problem, but it doesn't tell you whether it's a cost problem, a schedule problem, a risk problem. When you get questions like that, right off the bat, you know that prescriptive answers are going to be the wrong answer. There's a problem on a project. What should you do? A, crash. B, fast track. C, research the problem. D, call your boss. The answer is, of course, find out what the problem is, diagnose the problem. Definitely don't crash. Definitely don't fast track. Because if you do, you'll be prescriptive. You, you're being prescriptive. Because what you're saying should be done, you don't really know that that's the problem. You see what I'm saying? So define the problem. Identify the root cause if you can. If you cannot identify the root cause, then the option may be something else. So usually in a question, you're given the project manager should define the problem or the project manager should identify the root cause or the project manager should generate solutions. 
you know, before choosing fast tracking or crashing. You see, that's what the dig save is. Define, identify, generate, choose the best option. So D-I-G-C, those four are going to help you on the exam. The I is implement the solution, which would be you choosing the, the option really on the exam. And V, verify correctness. And you could go through those steps mentally. You could think about, okay, if I implement this, would this solve the problem? If I if I crash the project, will the problem go away? Think about it in that sense. That's the right way to think about these questions. Okay. So C eight point two. Okay. And um, believe it or not, it does work. It really does um, because it's problem solving in the real world. You can use that to solve multiple choice questions on the PMP exam. You can. In some questions, three answers could be all correct, but only one answer is best. What do you need to do in that case? You need to use the process of elimination. Okay? Go for the low-hanging fruit first. Like those gimmies, those questions that you know that you're all over, those should be the first ones you attack. Like I said a few hours ago, the PMI will give you a question that is an obstacle to answering one that you can answer more freely. So just keep that in mind. Okay. All right. We are almost about to shut this down. I've got just one more set of tips for you. And then we shut her down. So here we go. Last tips. Deduce the process. Which process am I in? Deduce the process group. Which process group is this? Hmm, this sounds like it's from executing, which means the answer cannot be WPI. That is an output of monitoring and controlling. You see how knowing where you're at is going to help you. It's going to help you answer the questions, my friend. Deduce the knowledge area. Someone's asking you to crash, but you know you're in quality. It doesn't make sense. You can eliminate based on knowing what is the process, what is the process group, what is the knowledge area, what is the tool and technique. We have a problem in that a deliverable is not clear enough. We need to get clarity. What should we use? A, <clears throat> test and inspection planning. B, product analysis. D, brainstorming. Come on. You know where product analysis is used. That's where you can shoot down the incorrect options. You know, okay, this is a defined scope thing. This is not a collect requirements thing. See what I'm saying? Deduce the problem. Like I said, select the best solution. Use the process of elimination. Maintain focus on the very first line. Okay? The very first line. Last but not least, follow the question ball as it's been passed around. It's going to be tossed around, passed around. you got to keep your eye on it. That's the trick to answering questions effectively on the exam. Okay? I hope this session has been of use to you. If it has been of use to you, give it a thumbs up. Share it with your friends. Share it on social share it with anyone who is taking this exam because honestly there's not a lot of deep conversation about the psychology of the exam and the questions and the emotional state you need to be in which i talked about a couple of hours ago you need to be in boss mode you don't don't let the exam jerk you around and make you feel like you're not in control it's all a head game head game okay also, there's not too much of this kind of stuff around that breaks down what the question writers are thinking in their heads as they serve you this stuff, you know. So, that's it, my friends. I hope it's been of value. I wish you all the best in your prep. Remember, if you are getting ready for the exam, one of the smartest things you can do is sign up for training at praiseon.com. That is P R A I. Z I O N dot com. There's lots of training sites out there. There's lots of courses, but I'm telling you, very few of them will go into the level of granularity that our course does, which is why I am asking you to check it out. I think 
you will be very pleasantly surprised at the level of detail and rigor that exists in this course. So head on down to praiseon.com, spelt as you see it, click on that first panel, go into the details, choose a one week option all the way to a six month option most people choose the two months you choose the two months option you're also going to get this study guide you're also going to get access to our online group there's a lot of stuff that you're going to be able to do when you sign up for this training highly highly recommend it i do not recommend any other training over the crazy on training now if you're on the crazy on sign, you're like, but Phil, I'm, I'm just a, a baby in this stuff. I don't even know my left from my right. Then you need to sign up for the free PMP exam basics. That's right. Free. Click on that link. Sign up for the free PMP exam basics. It's for those folks who are one day, one week, two weeks in. This will help align your thoughts before going on this bigger course. Okay. Now. If you want more products, click on the more products link. There's a plethora of study aids that can help those who have been for solid training but are still in need of a little bit more. We've got 15 hour boot camps, one day boot camps, all on demand. These are things that you can go into right now, sign up right now get access to it. If you feel you want to know more, maybe beyond PMP level about risk, we've got a curriculum that's dr. David Hilson and I there we've got a brilliant curriculum I've gone through the curriculum many times because dr. David Hilson is always dropping ridiculous gold he just got gold all over him it's ridiculous so sign up for that one we've also got the agile 101 you definitely want to listen to our agile expert Michael he is all up in the business of agile the psychological aspects of agile sign up for that Whatever you need, I'm telling you, it is on this site. I get so bored of having to say it over and 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 over ad nauseum, but it's part of my job to tell you where to get gold because we all need gold so we don't get old on this PMP thing. <laughs> we don't want to get old. We want to get it done quick. Two months, no more. All right, my friends. Take care. I'll see you in another video, hopefully soon. Bye for now.